have one big one. We are ready. Thank you. Welcome, everyone, to the December 8th City Commission meeting. Before we begin, we'd like the Communications and Creative Resource Director, Porter O'Neill, to say a few words. Thank you, Mayor. Good evening, everyone. My name is Porter O'Neill, and I'll be facilitating the Zoom portion of the meeting tonight. With me here is Sherry Riedemann, City Clerk, and she'll work alongside Mayor Finkeldye to help facilitate the meeting. This meeting is being recorded and broadcast on the city's YouTube channel and public access cable channel 25. During the meeting, when you are not participating, please mute yourself by clicking on the microphone icon found on the lower left-hand side of the Zoom menu next to the video icon. When you're muted, a red line will appear over the icon. Muting your microphone during the meeting will make it easier for everyone to hear. You'll just have to remember to unmute if and when you want to speak. In some cases, I may mute or unmute people as needed to minimize distractions during the meeting. Please remember to state your name every time you speak for the benefit of those listening remotely. You can turn your video camera on or off by clicking the video icon in the menu. For the purposes of this public meeting, when you are participating in the meeting, please keep your video on. When you are not participating in the meeting, it is okay to turn your video off. You will still be able to listen to the meeting when your video is off. You'll just have to remember to turn your video back on when you're participating. Turning your video off when you are not participating will help make sure that the active meeting participants can be seen on the screen. In some cases, I may turn someone's video off if they are not actively participating to avoid distraction during the meeting. You can always turn your video back on during the meeting. If you're participating by phone, you can click star six to unmute your phone and you can click star nine if you want to raise your hand to provide public comment. For those using Zoom, somewhere on your screen, you will see a choice to toggle between speaker and gallery view. Speaker view shows the active speaker. Gallery view tiles all the meeting participants. And now I'll turn the meeting back over to Mayor Finkeldye. Mayor Finkeldye, thank you, Porter. Um, I will now take roll call. Vice Mayor Shipley? Here. Commissioner Ananda? Here. Commissioner Lawson? Here. Commissioner Bowley? Here. Thank you, we are all present. Before we begin with our agenda, I would ask City Clerk Sherry Riedemann to give us a few reminders about this meeting. Thank you, Mayor. Sherry Riedemann, City Clerk. I'm going to provide a few procedural reminders for the virtual meeting. Commissioners, you must state your name and title each time you speak. All motions need to be stated clearly. After a, a motion is made and seconded, the mayor will call on commissioners individually to provide their vote. Mayor, you will then need to announce whether the motion carried and the count of the vote. Various members of city staff are present via Zoom and they must also state their name and title each time they speak. When public comment is sought on an item, individuals participating via Zoom should use the raise your hand feature. Windows and Mac users can access this feature through the participants button at the bottom of their screen. Android and iPhone users can access this feature through the more button located at the bottom right corner of their screen. For those calling in by phone, you may dial star nine. Individuals will be called upon by name in the order they appear on the meeting host screen. When you are called on, please unmute your listening device and state your name before speaking. The mayor will then call for in-person public comment for those without access to technology options. Staff present will direct you to the podium to speak following social distancing and safety protocols. The regular three minute time limit will apply. Mayor Finkeldye, thank you, Sherry. 
First item on our agenda is to approve the agenda. The city commission reserves the right to amend, supplement, or reorder the agenda during the meeting. Does any member of the commission which wish to amend the agenda? Or if not, I'd look for a motion. Move to approve the agenda. Commissioner Larson, second. Mayor Fingalai, it's a motion by Commissioner Ananda, a second by Commissioner Lawson. Commissioner Ananda? Aye. Commissioner Lawson? Aye. Vice Mayor Chipley? Aye. Commissioner Bowley? Aye. Motion passes five to zero. We now move to the consent agenda. All matters listed below on the consent agenda are considered under one motion and will be enacted by one motion. There'll be no separate discussion on those items. If discussion is desired, that item will be, be removed from the consent agenda and will be considered separately. Members of the public wishing to speak to an item that has been pulled off the consent agenda will be limited to three minutes for comments. To begin with, do any commissioners wish to pull an item off the consent agenda? Seeing none, if any member of the public would like to pull a, an item off the commission agenda and you're on Zoom, please use the raise your hand function. Or if you're in person, let Porter or Sherry know. This is Sherry Riedemann, City Clerk. Um, Mayor, there is not anyone on Zoom that has indicated- Like to make comment, but we do have one individual present here at City Hall that would like to have an item pulled. Um, you'll need to state which item you would like pulled from the agenda, sir. Yeah, I don't need to state that. My name is Eric Hyde, and I wish to get all of this stricken from the agenda. There are people on the streets right now that are suffering in the cold oh. elements and we need to talk about the homeless and helping them okay. right now. Mr. Hyde, you can do that in just a minute in the public comment um, as soon as we're done with the consent agenda. See no items being pulled from the consent agenda. Um, would any member of the commission like to make a motion? Commissioner Ananda, I move to approve the consent agenda. Commissioner Arson, second. Mayor Finkeldy, there is a motion by Commissioner Ananda, a second by Commissioner Lawson to approve the consent agenda. Commissioner Ananda? Aye. Commissioner Lawson? Aye. Vice Mayor Shipley? Aye. Commissioner Bowley? Aye. Thank you. Um, we now move to public comment. The public is allowed to speak to any items or issues. Excuse me, Vice Mayor. Excuse me, Mayor. This is Commissioner yes. Bowley. I I think you need to state the results of that vote. Ah, thank you. Mayor Fingaldi, thank you, Commissioner Bully. Uh, the, the motion passed five to zero. Thank Mayor, you for that. This is, Mayor, sorry, this is Sherry Riedemann, City Clerk. Can I also just remind you to make sure that at the end that you provide your vote, I or nay? Oh, good point. <laughs> See, I'm getting used to this. Mayor Fingaldi, thank you. I'm getting used to this. I did, um, Mayor Finkel, I votes aye as well. Thank you for that. I also, I'll vote, you know, just for the record, I voted aye on the agenda too, okay. <laughs> Thank you for those reminders. I'll get better at this. Okay, now we'll move on to public comment. The public is allowed to speak to any items or issues except those scheduled on the consent agenda or reg regular agenda portions of the agenda. As a general practice, the commission will not discuss or debate these items nor will the commission make decisions on items presented during this time. Rather, they will refer the items to staff for follow-up if necessary. Individuals should address all comments and questions to the commission. Each person will be limited to three minutes. If, if there's anyone um, online that would like to make public comment, please raise your hand via the raise your hand feature. Or if someone's in person beyond Mr. Hyde, who we know would like to speak, please let Sherry Porter, no. Can you scroll through this too in case it's a physical? Can you scroll through the pictures so I can, is that everybody? In case someone's physically oh, raising their hand. Um, that's everybody showing up on video. Okay. So I don't see anybody's hands raised. Okay. 
Uh, this is Sherry Riedemann, City Clerk. Um, there is no one on Zoom who has indicated they would like to provide public comment. So, um, Mr. Hyde, if you want to come forward, you can state your name. You'll have three minutes. <clears throat> this is Eric Hyde. Um, I don't know how to be nice. Uh, Mayor Finkeldy is being nice to me by addressing me by Mr. Hyde. That's pretty nice of him to do. Um, whoever... Uh, I'll just say this to the clerk, the city clerk. How dare you for limiting the public? This is my jurisdiction in the public. I represent the public. Excuse me, Mayor. Excuse me, Mayor. Comments must be addressed to the commission. This is Commissioner Bully. Please, please, let's do. Thank you, Commissioner Bully. Yes. Mr. try go ahead and address the comments to us. Okay. That applies to the commissioners, too. I represent the public interest. Eric Hyde, constitutional and cosmogonic law, how dare you deny me? I was some 30 minutes past an unlawful deadline to have my public comment concerning a $12,680.65 agenda request to help motion a vote to protect our, on average, at any one time, 246 homeless in the cold weather. This request includes trash bags, propane tanks with refills, propane heaters, tarps, Painters, plastic sheets, firewood, regular, regularly serviced porta potties, trash, and recycling services for three homeless camps along the Kansas River here in Lawrence, Kansas. The Lawrence Community Shelter only houses 40 per occupancy limit. Homeless hotels or hotel only has 38 rooms. But no, 30 minutes past is more important to you than helping the homeless exposed to the merciless cold. So here's your consequence. Motion a vote now. And then I have a minute and a half. I'm not hearing any yes. So no, here's your consequence. Uh, add it to your agenda next week. Consider this the request. Uh, I was going to say something mean there, but I'm leave it out. In the meantime, shame on you. Shame, shame, shame. Some 246 homeless will suffer as a result of your unlawful limitations to freedom of speech, the ability to redress our public officials for our grievances, and you violate my freedom of speech and assembly every commission meeting. You tell everyone to zoom into these meetings to request to even give a public comment. Uh, you limit the public to three minutes, but have no limitations for your own selves. Uh, now you need to be here in the city commission chamber. You need, you need to request permission from the public, not the other way around. We have the authority per the Kansas and United States Constitution. You do not. Uh, ignorance is not bliss. The boat you have missed. Who do you serve? I am done negotiating. I motion for a special agenda vote to approve $12,680.65 for cold weather supplies and waste removal for three homeless camps now. Eric Hyde. Mayor Finkel die. Sherry, is anyone else present to make a comment? Uh, this is Sherry Reedeman, City Clerk. There is not. Mayor Finkel, I thank you. We'll now move to regular agenda item. Oh, come in, Vice Mayor, Mayor Shibley. Vice Mayor Shibley. Um, I just maybe wanted to say, often we don't comment on that, but I did want to say there is on the agenda this evening at the end of the meeting on the manager's report, I believe, uh, a report about what we are currently doing and things that are uh, in the works. Um, I'm sure uh, Mr. Hyde would be interested in that. Mayor Fickle, I thank you, Vice Mayor Shipley. Moving to regular agenda item. Um, I believe we have three agenda items um, related to utilities, stormwater, and sanitation. I, I, based upon the presentation, I believe we'll consider those all together. Um, Mayor, this is Dave Wagner, Director for the Municipal Services and Operations. Um, we think that'd be prudent if it's okay with you folks. Mayor Finkel, that's great. Obviously, we'll take separate votes, but we'll hear the presentation together. So go ahead and please proceed. Okay. Well, well, thank you, Mayor and Commissioner. Again, it's Dave Wagner, Director for Municipal Services and Operations. I wanted to take a moment before Maggie and, and Amber and Mike take over and give you some of the details of what we've developed for your considerations tonight related to rates for both water and sewer, uh, storm water, as well as solid waste. It's it's a milestone night, I think, in, in some ways. Um, it's the first time we've actually uh, presented uh, comprehensive cost of service plans for both stormwater and solid waste. 
So we have models that will help us and hopefully you will find them helpful as well in your consideration of, of how to establish rates and what are good decisions and, and what are opportunities as well. Um, on the water side, um, we're presenting um, finally um, the actual inclining mechanism in order to uh, charge more at higher demand rates. So that's a, a significant milestone event. If you recall, a few years ago, we got instructions from the commission to pursue that. Um, we implemented a new CIS system that would support that rate structure. And um, you'll hear tonight that we're ready um, to recommend that we proceed down that road. Um, I think the uh, other thing that you'll see tonight is, is really the first use of an asset predictor model that can can analyze the differences of different treatments for a set of assets or infrastructure. Um, right now we have that developed for the water lines. You'll get to see those results tonight. Um, I would tell you, you can look forward to seeing more and more of those results as we get more refined. So we're excited about that. Um, um, Amber's the subject matter expert in that and there's some really interesting graphs. They take a little bit of of uh, contemplation when you look at those, but they tell a story, which I think is really good. Um, I wanna tell you that the options that we presented within the existing drafted ordinance uh, support the um, adopted uh, budget and CIP that um, the commission approved um, earlier this year. Um, there are alternatives to those and we will present those as well. Um, there's multiple different scenarios, plus there's betweener scenarios, I'm sure, um, that can um, be considered as well. So um, while we don't have a recommended option, we certainly have designed uh, scenario ones in all cases to support that adopted budget and CIP. There are trade-offs for all the other um, scenarios that you might give consideration to tonight. Um, with that, if if Mike, can you bring up that one graph that we I wanted to talk just real briefly on? Thank you, Mike. Um, you know, I we 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 weren't necessarily going to share this tonight, but I wanted to give a little bit of it of uh, an outlook that um, you see we we have a graph that represents sanitary sewer overflows from the. Uh, uh, mid 1990s to current, so it's about the same time frame as the um, current uh, uh, life of Stewart's car, um, as he mentioned last week. So um, I think the the results that you see here of the system has expanded, but we've also taken a concentrated and strategic effort at the problems of sanitary sewer overflows. I guess what I want to preach off this a little bit, if I can is to say we can identify problems and we still have problems to identify. We don't even know are out there what the solutions are, but over time we can make a difference, but it isn't gonna happen overnight. So you can see a quarter century of effort has really got that well managed for this set of assets. Um, sanitary sewer overflows are problematic. They're against the uh, requirements of the Clean Water Act and they're obviously a pragmatic thing to try to avoid at, at, at a lot of cost. So. Um, this is what we're looking for. I hope, I hope everybody understands that no matter what you do tonight, um, we're not going to have immediate results, whether it's on stormwater or um, even some of the sectors of the, of the water and wastewater utility. It takes a long haul approach to get there. Um, you know, when Craig came in, um, he coined the phrase, I think, your infrastructure needs love. Um, I think the, the adopted budget and the adopted CIP help us start down that road. Um, it won't be the end of it, but um, it's important to get there. So, Mike, that's that's all I kind of wanted to mention about that um, graph. I I certainly think, and I know you mentioned it, it last week in consideration of the Stratford Tower. Um, that intuitively, and more and more, we'll be able to show you data, and in this case on water lines, we can. That um, um, deferral can cost you more money than not deferral. Um, these are difficult times. Staff knows that. Um, um, it's a rough time to propose rates um, that are above what we have today. Um, but then at the same time, it's, it's also detrimental to know that if you do defer some things, you'll either suffer, suffer service interruptions or you may increase actual costs down the road. So we'll let you, we'll let you chew on what Maggie has developed for, for the most part. Um, 
she's had a lot of help from Mike Lawless and Amber Schultz and some of the other staff as well. So I think with that, I'll turn it over to Maggie um, and let her kind of start down the road with the other slideshow. And plus there's any questions you have of me directly. Maggie? Maggie Mahoney, Management Analyst for Municipal Services and Operations. Good evening, Commission and Mayor. Um, as Dave said, um, there was a lot of help putting together this presentation, and I wanted to thank in particular Mike Lawless for all his help in putting this all together and uh, all of the MSO staff that spent many hours doing this. So thank you for your patience and in, in waiting for this presentation. We appreciate it. Um, so. I think a good place to start is an overview of where we are and why we're here today. So back in July on the 28th, at that city commission meeting, the commission set the maximum expenditure authority for the 2021 budget and CIP. So what that meant was we didn't know what the rates were going to be because the rate models were not completed yet, but we set a maximum amount to fully fund the budget. And then the committee's scale of scenarios to set those rates, wastewater and solid waste. So that is what we're doing today. So what we're going to show you are uh, various scenarios for each of those utilities. Each one will include a five-year projection of the CIP, but I would just want to be very clear that we are not actually setting any multiple year rates. We're only going to be setting rates for 2021. So we're going to go through all of the scenarios. Um, and just a reminder that you're setting the rate that will fully fund the adopted budget for 2021, or you are selecting an alternate rate that will modify the budget in some way. So in the sliding scale scenarios, scenario one for both stormwater and wastewater, water and wastewater, fully funds the adopted budget for 2021, as well as the 2021 to 2025 CIP. In the case of solid waste, there is deficit spending in each scenario. So in that case, scenario one does allow for better alignment with the cost of service and a slower decline to fund balance. There we go. So the proposed ordinances are all for scenario one. And so those ones will conform to the adopted budget. So what we're going to do is we're going to go through the entire presentation and we'll review all of those scenarios and we'll take action at the end of the presentation on all three of the ordinances that are presented. And at that time, we'll discuss options and modifications for the commission to consider. And again, just a reminder, we're only doing the 2021 budget rates in these ordinances. So we're going to start with stormwater. So here is a summary of the stormwater scenarios presented. As you can see, the scenario number is there on the left, one through four, and then an annual rate increase for the five years of 2021 through 2025. And then on the right is the total amount that is funded for the CIP in each scenario. So again, scenario one is the, is the scenario that fully funds the CIP and adopted budget. So in 2021, the increase to the stormwater rate would be 50%, and then a 4.5% increase annually after that. In scenario two, it's a 25% rate increase in 2021, with a 10% increase each year after that. Scenario three, 10% each year for five years, and in scenario four would be in the no rate scenario. So as you can see, looking at the total CIP funded, you have almost $40 million funded in the first scenario. As you go down, you, you lose about $4.5 million in scenario two, and then $9 million in scenario three, and then you're basically funding about half the, of that, uh, the adopted CIP in scenario four. So scenario one, again, just to reiterate, um, this is the fully adopted, the, this fully funds the adopted budget in CIP. And so this is 
just the list that is from the actual CIP. So our method for evaluating each scenario was to look at the fund balance in terms of days of operating cash on hand. So as you can see in fiscal year 2020 in the stormwater utility, we have almost 800 days of operating cash. So in fiscal year 2021, we've used about half of that. So what we're doing is we're spending down fund balance to get to the target of 60 days of operating cash reserve, which is that green line down there. So every scenario we look at for stormwater is doing the same thing. We're, we're spending down to get to that target by 2025. So in each, in each uh, year, the graph will look similar, but every year is going to be at or above that target. So rather than show you the same graph four times, we're just gonna show it to you one time to explain our method of how we were looking at that. So now in scenario two, this is the 25% increase in 2021 and then a 10% increase in 2022 through 2025. So just note that that funds $4.4 million less in CIP. So as you can see, there's a list of the fully funded projects and programs, but now we have a category of deferred, extended or reduced projects or programs that are affected by that the, the missing $4.4 million. Scenario three, which is 10% annually, 2021 through 2025, funds about $13.5 million less of the adopted CIP. So again, you have a category of fully funded projects and programs. It's a little shorter. Now we have a category of deferred, extended, and reduced, and a new category where we have inadequate funding or work that can't be performed. And we actually have three projects in that category in this scenario. So scenario four, which is the no annual increase scenario, funds $18.6 million less. And you still have some programs and projects that are fully funded, still some that are deferred or extended or reduced, still some that cannot fund. But the biggest change here is that the system ID asset assessment and model creation project comes off of the fully funded list and cannot be performed. That is the number one project from the, the CIP prioritization that was identified. So in this scenario, you can't do the number one project. So looking at um, a couple of graphs, this rate comparison graph is actually one we showed you back in July at the commission meeting. The, what this is is the red line is starting in 1997 when the stormwater master plan was created. And that is the, those are the actual rate increases with the final point from 2020 is jumping up to the, the scenario one rate, the 50% increase. So you can see the actuals. The blue line would, is sort of a hypothetical situation if we would have started um, at the recommended $4 per ERU rate back in 97 and done an incremental increase every year, we would be at this point. So really the point is, is you, you're seeing all of this area under, under that line. So that's, that's revenue um, that could have been uh, used for de to defer maintenance and work on projects. So, and the other point is, you can see there were many, many years where there were no rate increases. So um, now that is the reason why we're in need of more of a dramatic rate increase this year. So this graph really illustrates that, um, you know, perhaps an incremental increase uh, approach definitely would be more equitable and it may be more palatable over time. So in looking at uh, comparisons of the um, scenarios themselves, you can see here we have the current rate over there in 2020, the little orange dot. So we've got the four different scenarios. So scenarios one, two, and three are showing that incremental increase up to the, the point in 2025. 
And then of course you have your um, scenario four, which is a no rate increase. And then one more comparison graph. These are the uh, 2021 monthly ERU rates. These are the comp comparisons of uh, other localities in, uh, in the area. So the, the Lawrence uh, scenarios are in the kind of peach color there. So over here on the left, you see Lawrence 2021 scenario one is at 675, scenario two at 563. Scenario three at 495, and then the current rate for 2020 and scenario four for 2021 is there at 450. So you can see how we compare to others nearby. So in sum for the 2021 rates, again, looking at the, the four different scenarios with the rate increase just for 2021, can see what the rate per ERU would be in each of those scenarios. Starting with scenario one, uh, the ERU would be 675, which is an increase of 225 and on down the line. So this gives you a sense of the annual increase you're looking at per residential customer per ERU. And just a reminder that ERU means equivalent residential unit. So that was what we had for stormwater. Moving on to water and wastewater. Um, Maggie, this is Mike Lawless with yeah. Municipal Services and Operations Deputy Director. Um, I think if, um, I guess we should ask the commission um, if you'd like to take questions on the uh, individual uh, utilities or if you'd rather wait until the end. Um, it's really kind of your preference, but. I thought I would just stop Maggie here and see if um, if you guys had a preference one way or the other. Mayor Finkel, die. Do any commissioners have questions they'd like, like to ask now or wait till the end? Uh, Commissioner Larson here. Um, at some point, and I, it doesn't have to be right now, um, I would like to have staff explain the ERU and what that means. Um, at some point, I'd appreciate that. Mayor Finkel, I think that's a good explanation right here since it relates closely to the storm water. Maggie, do you get to answer that question? Or? Uh, Maggie Mahoney, um, Management Analyst, Municipal Services and Operations. So um, the, the ERU is the equivalent residential unit. So that is a measure of impervious surface within the, the city. So um, currently that measurement is uh, 2,366 square feet per ERU. Um, Commissioner Larson, how is that applied to commercial versus residential and industrial? Maggie, do you want me to take this one? Yes, thank you, Matt. I was just going to ask you. <laughs> okay. Matt Bond, uh, Engineering Program Manager. So when they set this up, uh, industrial and commercial properties, the way that works is you take your amount of impervious surface on those parcels and divide it by 2366 and then take it times the current ERU rate. For residential properties, it's broken up into a series of five different uh, categories or five different slots. And then those are based off of um, uh, square footage on the house. The one thing that you need to take into consideration uh, with the correspondence we got earlier today was that that table does not include any driveways, sidewalks, patios, outbuildings. So when they set that up, the only data they had at the time was the actual impervious surface of just the footprint of the house. So there's built in um, additional area that you can take into account for that extra driveway or sidewalks or things of that nature. Does, does that help clear that up? Yeah, um, 
uh, and since you referred to that email we got earlier, can um, is there a disparity in the way we charge commercial versus residential? Would you would you say? No, I wouldn't. I actually talked to Chad. The Mayor Finkled Eye, can you introduce yourself? Matt, Matt Bond, engineering program manager. Sorry, Mayor. Um, so I'd actually talked to the previous stormwater engineer to make sure that I had all of my P's and Q's in line and had all my facts straight. He said they had gone through several different scenarios with the commission and gone back and forth. I believe it was three commission meetings. And that was the um, uh, method that they thought was the most equitable and fair. He said at one point they had nine different categories and they, they, they pared it down to five. Um, at the time, um, there were so many residential parcels that they would have had to go through. It was uh, prohibitive for that. So for instance, we have over 17,000 residential parcels that we'd have to go out and get information on. He said what they did do is they took a small sample size and got that data uh, with regards to um, driveways, um, sidewalks, patios, over I think it was 100 different properties throughout the town. And that was the most equitable uh, format that they could come up with. Commissioner Larson, thank you. Vice Mayor Shipley, um, I hope this isn't going on a tangent, but I wonder uh, with our recent use of LIDAR, if um, a program like that might not give us uh, more information or something more honest or equitable? Matt Bond, stormwater uh, <laughs> engineering program manager. Sorry, I've had all these years as stormwater engineer. Um, yes, that's something we are looking at because uh, we can go to our LIDAR data and get up all our planometrics. That's something that we are going to do with the upcoming rate with, that was what the uh, consultants had looked at. And so we are going to take a look at that. Mike Lawless, uh, deputy director for MSO. Um, I just want to tag on to what Matt said there just a little bit. I think that was one of the things that um, we had looked at when we um, were working on the model um, that it had been, it's been 24 plus years since we have looked at that. Um, technology's changed a lot, both LIDAR, the aerial photography that we have, and, and many of the layers that are in our GIS. And so while it would have been nice to be able to do all that at once, as Dave mentioned, you know, we were working on three different um, rate models this year, two brand new ones and an update of the water wastewater. And so, you know, I think you'll see that over time um, as these models mature and that we have time to get in and dig in deeper each year that we'll be able to take a look at things like this. So the, the ERU, how it's calculated, um, what it's based on, um, the information that we have today is, is much more robust than what we had. And, and our intention is to take a look at that um, as we go forward. Commissioner Arce, so uh, if I understand correctly, um, the, way our, the way we have it set up with our ERUs, you don't believe that there's any disparity in the way um, smaller houses are charged versus commercial or larger houses? Do you think it's um, basically pretty even as to how they're charged? Is that what I understand? Matt Bond, uh, engineering program manager. Yes, I would say that that's the case. Is it 100% equal all the way across? No, because, you know, if you look at the for one of the tiers in stormwater, you say it's from 1801 to 3000. Well, if you have a 3001 square foot house, it kicks you into that next tier. So much kind of like your tax system, you make X amount of dollars over, then you're kicked into the next tier. So that's kind of the way that works. Okay, Commissioner Arson, thank you. Mayor Finkel, I have questions on stormwater before we proceed to water wastewater. Seeing none, Maggie, you can proceed. Maggie Mahoney, Management Analyst for Municipal Services Operations. We will take another break at the end of water wastewater for a session of questions. Thank you, Mike. So, um, so water wastewater, again, we're this is set up um, very similar to stormwater. So here we have our summary of scenarios one through five in this case 
and then the annual revenue increase in each scenario starting in 2021 through 2025, and then with the total uh, CIP amount that is funded with those revenue in, um, total over that time, that five-year time. So in scenario one, which fully funds the adopted CIP, you have $155 million in water and wastewater. And then that reduces the 6.5% in 2021, 5.25 in 2021 for scenario three. Scenario four is 4%. Now scenario five is a little bit different than the others. Uh, scenario five is the lower rate, 4% uh, in 2021 and five and a half in 2022. So, but that is, this is a scenario where we're still doing all of the work of the, the fully adopted 2021 20, to 25 CIP. So that means you have to have higher increases starting in 23 to, um, to fund that. So in essence, by the end of that scenario, you actually pay over $3 million more to complete the same amount of work. So that's a little bit different than the other, the way the other scenarios are um, set up. So again, looking at each scenario, scenario one fully funds the budget. Um, and this is a 7.75 increase in 2021. So that is the list of all of the projects and programs that are in the adopted CIP. And then I'm actually gonna ask uh, Mike to explain uh, this slide. Sure, Mike Lawless, uh, Deputy Director for Municipal Services and Operations. <clears throat> Much like the slide that Maggie had for stormwater where we showed um, cash on hand, um, the water wastewater utility is a, a little bit different in that um, we have the revenue bonds that we um, are able to, to um, source through our rates. Um, and one of the things that we do is we go to um, Moody's for our rating criteria. Um, last time our rating was a double A2 or a double A. And um, one of the criteria for that rating is our days of cash on hand. Um, it also has one for our um, debt coverage um, so that we can show that we're bringing in enough revenue to not only pay our operations and maintenance, but um, our debt service as well, and then have a little extra so that we have enough coverage to, to provide that incremental difference so that the, the bondholders are assured that we can um, pay our bills in essence. Um, in talking with Moody's, our debt coverage, our debt service ratio was a little bit less or under what the criteria was for the AA rating. And so in discussions with them, um, they felt like um, having a little bit more uh, cash on hand available um, would help make up for any um, downgrading or uh, differences that they might have in that uh, uh, debt coverage. And so that's why our target here is um, 250 days of cash on hand. And so much like the other ones, um, uh, the stormwater scenarios, the, the five scenarios that we've shown tonight all maintain that um, 250 days of, of cash on hand, um, either at or just above that, um, like you're seeing here for scenario one. Maggie Mahoney, Management Analyst, Municipal Services and Operations. Thank you, Mike. So um, as he mentioned, so you're gonna see, you, you, you would see the same um, or very similar graph for each of the scenarios. So we're not gonna show that more than once, but this, this is the method that was used to determine um, that threshold for days of cash on hand. And then um, now we have the predictor model. So Amber is actually gonna talk about this. All right, good evening, Amber Schultz, General Manager, MSO. So with, with each scenario, we're gonna show you a couple of graphs 
um, based on some predictive modeling of our water main assets, which I just want to point out is not inclusive of all the assets covered within this rate structure. Um, the objective of the modeling was to, to determine the impact of our funding strategies, both capital and O&M, and deterioration on the water main condition. Um, so while methods exist to assess the actual condition, structural condition, sorry, of the of water mains, it's very cost prohibitive. So staff, along with um, um, a software called Predictor, developed some alg algorithms to estimate condition based on remaining useful life of derived, um, derived from various criteria. So again, what you're seeing here is a visualization of water main condition represented by remaining useful life on a scale of one to 100. So as you imagine, green is good or an indication of more remaining useful life. Orange and red assets are approaching their end of life, which represents also a higher likelihood of breaks. So we can interpret from this, this first graph that you're gonna see here with, with the-, with the um, Excuse me, Mayor. Um, this is Commissioner Larson. Amber, could you tell me what the x-axis is again? I'm sorry, so the x-axis is years? Years, so, okay. Yeah, yep, years. Um, so what we can turn from this first graph is that we have a similar distribution of conditions. So you'll see across the, that, that all of the colors from red to orange are evenly distributed in, distributed, um, in near to mid years, indicating that there's a similar percentage of assets that's gonna replace, be replaced from year to year. And a minimal number of assets are likely to have a, a water main break. Also, you can see that in some of the out years, there'll need to be a little some refinements and readjustments to recalibrate so that we don't experience a slight deterioration um, as our model is predicting. So in a nutshell, coming back to a little bit what, what Dave said um, earlier about our um, planning and addressing assets for the long haul, this graph shows that, you know, over since the last seven or eight years, our funding strategies are and will be, um, you know, the small adjustments sufficient to sustain the current state of the water system and reduce the, the likelihood of breaks. So with that, Maggie, you wanna to go to the next slide? So an additional output of our, our predictive model shows the, the cost of maintenance, um, which represents in this case, um, um, fixing breaks relative to capital investment. So you can see that this scenario, that there are minimal maintenance costs, which is shown in green, relative to the overall uh, capital improvement program, which is shown in orange. All right, next slide, Maggie. And I'll just jump in on this really quick. So um, Maggie Mahoney, Management Analyst, Municipal Services and Operation. So um, this is the list for scenario two of projects and programs um, at the six and a half percent increase in 2021. Um, so major point here being that this is funding $2.7 million less of CIP over that five-year period. So here um, you have your fully funded, and then you have the group of deferred, extended, and or reduced projects and programs um, as a result. And then you do have one project that you uh, cannot do because you have inadequate funding in this scenario. Amber Schultz, General Manager, MSO. So in this scenario, um, you can see um, a slightly higher percentage deteriorates a little bit more quickly um, with more significant deterioration in our out years. Next slide, Maggie. Suzanne, you can see in those out years um, that our maintenance increase uh, increases also for those uh, break repairs. Maggie Mahoney, Management Analyst, Municipal Services and Operations. So in scenario three, this is the 5.25% um, annual increase in 2021. Here you're getting $68 million less CIP that work you can perform over the five years. So the list of fully funded um, goes down to three projects or programs. You've got still have a group of deferred, extended, or reduced projects and programs. And now you have a rather lengthy list of um, projects and programs that you cannot perform because there is inadequate funding.
Amber Schultz, General Manager, Municipal Services and Operations. So again, I just want to remind that this is for, for water mains. And what you're seeing with just a 2.5% reduction in rates for 2021, you can see in this graph that deterioration occurs much more quickly with a significant portion of our assets um, approaching the end of their remaining useful life in about 15 years, uh, which is, is also an indicator, an indicator of a higher likelihood of, of a water main break. Maggie, next slide. And here you can see much higher maintenance co costs almost immediately and exponential increases um, in, the, in those out years. Maggie Mahoney, Management Analyst, Municipal Services and Operations. So in our uh, next scenario, scenario four, this is sort of the minimal increase uh, at 4% in 2021 and 2% annually after that. So this funds, well, it's easier to say it funds $17.8 million than to note the amount that it doesn't fund, because it's such a big number. But um, that $17.8 million is available over the entire five-year period, and it is divided between water and wastewater. So that is really just getting you minimal cash construction that doesn't include any formal CIP, um, some plant maintenance, and just other essential or emergency work. So as you can see, we have in red font there that this plan is not compliant with the integrated plan. So the only reason we um, show you this, we, we would not recommend this as a scenario um, for you to consider, but it is important to show you this as a baseline. Ms. Mayor Finkeldye, what can you describe what, what do you mean by the integrated plan? Mike, would you be able to comment on that or? Sure. <clears throat> Mike Lawless, uh, Deputy Director for MSO. Um, our integrated plan is what we have with the, um, the state of Kansas for our um, um, wastewater um, and um, with, with our uh, permits. It's been incorporated into our uh, NPDES permits where we've, um, it gives us the ability to take the, the CIP, take control of our CIP and our projects and, and basically plan the work out when we want um, instead of the, the state or someone else telling us um, how and when we need to do that work. So um, for instance, the, the nutrient project on the Kansas River wastewater plant, um, you know, we had um, bonds that paid off um, I believe this year in 21, um, it, it may be that there's one payment in 22. And so what we asked or what we did in the integrated plan was we kind of gave ourselves a breather of one year of uh, rates, you know, so that we didn't go right from one big project paying off into the next big project of the nutrient project at Kansas River. So the, the bonds for the expansion um, at that plant from 2004 um, are paying off. And basically with the integrated plan, we were able to um, give ourselves a, a kind of a breather year um, and, and tell the state, this is what our plan is for doing that work. Um, and so the, the integrated plan is our, um, um, is, is incorporated to, into our NPDES permits. Um, we're also um, working to expand that integrated plan with our MS4 permit for stormwater, um, as well as some of our other environmental programs. Mayor Pingledi, thank you, that helps. This is Dave Wagner, Director of, of uh, Municipal Services and Operations. I just wanted to also add to Mike's comment, we're also looking at um, incorporating our commitments or our requirements with the uh, uh, farmland industry site um, uh, for uh, nutrient control there as well into that integrated plan, which provides us some local control rather than just regulated control on some of those band dates, as Mike kind of mentioned. So we can stage those out to make them doable and significantly more affordable than what a, uh, a court might ask us to do. So. Um, it's an agreement um, by MOU with uh, the state of Kansas that we've had for a long time. It's one of the first and only in the country that I'm aware of that's integrated in permits without a consent decree. 
So it's a, it's a good thing to have. Um, I would, and, and as Maggie mentioned, this is not one we would recommend. And in fact, I would, I would anticipate that if, if this was the direction we go, uh, we'll get the attention of the regulator in this regard. But it is important to be able to see what's the, what's the zero sum. If we don't do a bonded CIP, this gives you the values of what revenue increases we still need to, to uh, meet those past commitments that we already have for bonded projects. And um, I guess my question is, uh, this is being shown as a non-recommended plan, but it still involves a rate increase. Is that correct? That's correct. All right, Amber Schultz, General Manager, Municipal Services and Operations. So lastly, you can see in this graph that, that just in a handful of years, we can see how quickly, how, how a large portion of our, our water main assets approach the end of their remaining useful life. Next slide, Maggie. And here um, within this, this cost of ownership graph, you can really see um, how our funding strategies have in, impacted maintenance um, on the on all years near near and out Maggie Mahoney management analyst municipal services and operations so in this final uh, scenario scenario five this is where um, we have a four percent increase in 2021 and five and a half percent increase in 2022 um, necessitating a ten and a quarter percent increase in the last three years in 2023 through 2025. So this is the, the situation where the adopted CIP, the five-year CIP is being completed, but the, the rates, the rate increases are being deferred two years. So in this situation, um, it is fully funded, but you can see the list of deferred, extended, or reduced projects or programs that has to happen because of the um, reduced funding in the first two years. And just note that it costs about an extra $3.2 million to defer that work. So Mike Lawless is going to talk a little bit about inclining block rate implementation. Uh, Mike Lawless, Deputy Director for MSO. Um, just to kind of follow up with some of Dave's comments at the beginning. Um, so with the um, with the ordinance that you have before you tonight, um, we're recommending the effective date be January 1 um, for the, the rates. Um, that would be um, on the water side, that would be a uniform rate initially from January 1 to March 31. Um, and then effective April 1 on residential rates, we would um, then implement the individual inclining block rate, um, which would be based on our winter quarter average. Um, again, as Dave mentioned, the previous direction that we got from the commission was for um, conservation, um, affordability, and equity in our, in our rates. And the individual inclining block is um, the rate methodology which allows us to do that or best allows us to do that. Um, you know, we, as Dave mentioned, we've tried this um, several times. Um, in 2018, um, we ran into issues with our billing system. Um, we corrected those and got that billing system online at the end of 2019, and we're ready to go in, in um, 2020. And then COVID hit, and, and so we recommended not implementing that um, at the beginning of the, the pandemic. Um, and so here we are, um, maybe third time is a charm for us to get individual inclining blocks going. Um, and, um, and so as we mentioned, the, the individual inclining block is based on the winter quarter average. So it's the average water usage for the periods that fall in December, January, and February. And I think if you go to the next slide, Maggie, um, I think we've showed this, um, graphic before, but we have three blocks in the individual inclining block. 
So the first block um, is 125% or less of that winter quarter average. Um, anything between 125% and 200% falls into block two, and it has a 10% increase in that block rate over block one. And then block three is any usage that is above 200% and it has a 15% higher rate than block one. Um, everybody starts over every month. So every month, everybody starts at zero and works through block one, block two and block three if their usage is that high. Um, if they use less than 125%, of the winter quarter average um, than all their usages in block one. Um, and in the scenario that we showed here of the uniform rate um, going into effect January 1 and the block rates going into effect April 1, um, the block one rate would actually for 2021 would be less than the uniform rate um, for 2021. So if we had a uniform rate, um, it has to be a little bit higher because we don't have the higher blocks to help make up for that. So once we went to the um, inclining block rate, those that had only usage in block one would actually see um, a decrease um, in the rate. Actually, everybody would see it in their block one um, but those that stayed only in block one would actually see that lower, um, lower bill. Maggie Mahoney, Management Analyst, Municipal Services and Operations. Thank you, Mike. Um, so uh, our next slide is looking at an area comparison of residential rates for water and wastewater. So these are based on uh, the uniform rate and an average of 4,000 gallons of water and 4,000 gallons of sewer. So you can see the, the Lawrence current and then the five scenarios are outlined in that, that blue block there. So Lawrence 2020 um, is over there to the right and then scenarios uh, one through five are right in a row. <clears throat> and I would also- <laughs> Mr. Arson, I have just a quick question on the, the this chart right here, this graph. So uh, is there a reason why we're using these cities as comparison, but we don't use the same cities as comparison for the, um, the stormwater numbers that we had in the earlier slide? Mike Lawless, Deputy Director for Municipal Services and Operations. Um, so the, the previous slide on stormwater, um, not all, I don't believe that all of the, um, all of these um, cities um, have um, stormwater, um, stormwater utilities. Um, the reason that we use these is the, the, the list of cities here are the ones that we have shown in the past and so it was for historical comparison. And um, we can certainly, we could certainly get those for other cities, but these are the ones that we've used in the past and mm -hmm. um, it, it kind of keeps that comparison um, the same year to year. Thank you. Maggie Mahoney, Management Analyst, Municipal Services and Operations. And I would just mention we do have one um, proposed rate for water one this uh, they are setting the rate or, or voting on the rate uh, later in the month um, so this scenario does include the proposed 2.8 percent increase so the water wastewater summary we have again a table similar to what we saw with stormwater where we have the various scenarios and you can see the current rate um, here at the top. And again, this is based on sort of a, a hypothetical or an average uh, 4,000 gallon user of water and sewer per month at the uniform rate. Just to get a point of comparison between the different scenarios, the cost difference would be. So as you can see, we have the 2021 monthly rate for each of those broken out um, 
then we break down the the change from 2020 to 2021 monthly and both annually in each scenario. And this is actually the end of the water wastewater section. So I would open uh, up for comments or questions from the commission. Mayor Finkel, I have questions from the commission. Seeing none, Maggie, you can proceed with the last part. I'm sure we'll have questions when we get to discussion. Maggie Mahoney, Management Analyst for Municipal Services and Operations. Thank you, Mayor. So moving on to solid waste, um, as Dave mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, um, solid waste is a very new uh, rate model. This is actually our newest, I would, I would say. Um, so with this very new rate model, uh, we have the very clear objective to align costs with service delivery for solid waste services. Um, so now that we have, uh, we sort of have a, an initial model, we are learning lots of things. And um, so far what we have learned are that the 2020 rates are not covering uh, fully, our, we're not recovering costs for providing the services for solid waste and recycling. We also know that the sing single family rate payers are over recovering relative to their cost of service. And we know that commercial rate payers are under recovering relative to the cost of service. So now that we are aware of these issues, we can begin to address them and start to work towards equity and efficiency within the solid waste operation. So I mentioned that in that previous slide that the 2020 rates are not recovering our cost. So this is a revenue projection with our current rates going out 2021, five years. So if we just kept the current rates for solid waste as they are, we have various lines. I know it's sort of hard to read. There's, there's different colored lines for each of the different um, services. For example, uh, SF is single family residential. Um, we have multifamily residential etc. And we will get into the, the details of those in the upcoming slides. But the costs for each of those are the individual lines. So you can see some are well above zero, some are below, in the case of the purple line, uh, commercial front load and rear load that is well below uh, zero, zero being the line we want to get to for uh, cost recovery. What this graph is also showing us is that we are deficit spending. So in 2021, we would be just over a million dollars deficit spending just in that year. On down the line through 2025, those amounts are not cumulative, those are annual. So that is, so by 2025, uh, that is $2.5 million of deficit spending just within that year. Cumulatively, that is $9.4 million that is coming out of the fund balance. And going from year 24 to 25, early into 2025 is when the fund balance would go negative. So I'm looking, so we need to do something about rates. So we have the model to give us, um, you know, some maps uh, to guide us. So. Um, now I want to kind of switch gears a little bit and talk about the rate structures that are assumed within the model. So again, these are rate structures. This is These are the methods of how we bill customers, not the rates themselves. And these are, um, these are the things that are built into the model that help us produce the rates and the cost recovery. So first of all, single family residential, commercial dumpsters, and downtown are unchanged in their rate structures. We aren't changing the way we're billing or calculating bills for anybody in those categories. Multifamily residential is going to be unchanged in 2021. We are not proposing a change at this time. Currently, multifamily uh, customers either pay a single family or a commercial rate. 
So the model assumes we are going to implement a new uniform rate structure starting in 2022, because that is a priority that multifamily residential customers should be paying uh, the same amount. Roll-off is unchanged. And we are assuming that we are going to start a commercial cardboard recycling in 2022, that that fee would be added in 2022 if it is not in the 2021 rates. So in each scenario, there's, there's a lot to look at between all the different services that are offered. But we've broken them down to kind of match those rate structures. So single family residential in this scenario, scenario one, there is no increase to single family residential in any of the years. The multifamily customers that are paying single family residential would not have an increase either. With the change or, or pr proposed change that we, we would deal with um, with the 2022 budget cycle um, of establishing a uniform rate for multifamily, we have assumed in the model that that would be $16. I don't know how accurate that is until we update the model again. But for um, the purposes of this exercise, that, that is what we assume. So it was actually a reduction of 17.36% to bring that group down from the residential rate down to at the uniform multifamily rate. In the case of multifamily that use a shared commercial dumpster, because that is a commercial class, in 2021, those customers would have a 5% increase. In 2022, to bring them up to the uniform rate for multifamily, that would vary because the commercial customers pay um, just various amounts. So we can't determine what their actual increase or potential decrease would be in those situations, but it would vary to get it up to that uniform rate or to the uniform rate in 2022. Once that uniform rate for multifamily is established, there would not be, um, that would be set at an amount that would not require an increase for a number of years. Roll-offs would be a 3% increase in 2021, also in 2022, no increase in 23 and 24, and then you would need another one out in 2025. Commercial front and rear load, as well as commercial cart classes would be an annual 5% increase for all five years. The downtown rates would be 5% in 2021 and 10% in 2022 through 2024, 25, sorry. And then finally, uh, recycling, that is school and commercial cardboard. Just note that uh, commercial cardboard isn't being added until 2022. So just in 2021 is just the school recycling rate would be 5%. And then in 2022, um, that would be a 5% increase for both school and commercial cardboard. So similar to the looks at, that we had at uh, for stormwater and water wastewater, we're looking at days of operating cash. Um, on hand for this operation as well. So the target for a solid waste operation is 90 days of an operating cash reserve. So that is that, that blue line there. So as you can see in 2021, we do have um, close to 200 days of operating days. But again, we are working our way down to a, a target of 90 days by 2025. Commissioner Larson, I have a question about that. Who, how is that target set? Is it set by um, some sort of rating we have or, or how is that done? So that is the um, operating budget. For example, in 2021, it's um, based on $12.7 million. And then that is literally divided by 365 days a year. So it's, it's a daily average. In this case, it's about $34,000 a day. Um, so, and then 90 days is, is the 
the threshold where that's set uh, to have your minimum target at. But that's that's where that like number comes from. And that's based on, um, for example, you know, stormwater is only 60 days, but solid waste has more um, equipment needs and things like that. It's just a different type of operation. So targets are set at different levels. Not sure if that answered your question. Yeah, question, thank you. So this this isn't like a regulatory level that we have to maintain or um, it's not dictated by statute or ordinance. Megan um, Honey, management analyst, municipal services, not, not to my knowledge, but please someone. Um, Mike Lawless, deputy director for municipal services and operations. Um, Commissioner Larson, this is, um, when, when um, this is kind of from the recommendation of the consultant that helped us put together the models, one of our questions to them was because we didn't, we don't, really, we never had kind of a um, a target or any kind of uh, minimum that we had set, and so we we didn't really know where to start. And you know, with the consultant, they have experience with lots of utilities, and we asked them, you know, what you know, help us determine what would be a, um, an adequate target for those um, cash on hand. Um, and um, for the stormwater one, the recommendation was 60 days. And for the, the solid waste, the consultant recommended um, 90 days. And so kind of, that's kind of what Maggie said is there, there are different operations. You know, you have a, a lot more equipment and moving parts um, on the solid waste than you do on the on the stormwater side. Uh, Commissioner, Commissioner Arson, thank you. Maggie Mahoney, Management Analyst, Municipal Services and Operations. Thank you, Mike. Um, so for solid waste scenario one, again, looking at the same net revenue map, we, look, we looked at uh, what would happen if we kept the 2020 current rates for the next five years. And we, we were going the other direction. We were uh, really eating into fund balance. So here you can see with scenario one, um, we are starting to turn things around. So um, looking at the, uh, the lines for the different services, that blue line on the top there is, I can pointing at my screen as if you can see what I'm pointing at. Um, single family residential is that blue line. So as you can see, that starts very high. It's over $600,000 in 2021. Um, and then it is, it's going down towards zero by 2025. Conversely, you have this purple line down at the bottom of the screen. That's the commercial front and rear load. And so that one is, is over negative 650,000. So that's deficit spending for that, um, that particular operation. And then it is, uh, you know, approaching zero, it's getting much closer to zero by 2025. So all of the lines are moving in that direction. So that that's, you know, that's our target here by the end of five years is to get um, to that, that goal there. And then our deficit spending itself in 2021, we are still deficit spending, but um, in this case, it's just over 800,000. And then it is, um, you know, getting getting better then as we get to 2025, we're, we're only just over about 240,000 deficit spending in 2025. So this just goes back to the slide, you know, our initial slide where we said we learned that uh, single family residential was over recovering and commercial was under recovering. This is, this is uh, you know, you're seeing those lines very far apart and then we're, we're trying to bring them closer together. So scenario two is uh, the scenario in 2021 where we are not proposing any increase to any of the uh, operations just in 2021. But what this does do is give us a good look at what that does to the rates, uh, potentially what the need would be for um, the, re the rest of the, the CIP, the five-year CIP in 2022 through 2025. So just going line by line, uh, very similarly, you see single family residential with no increases, um, but in 2025, you do need a small increase of one and a half percent out in 2025, whereas in the previous scenario, it was zeros all the way across the board. In multifamily uh, with single family rate, as well as multifamily commercial dumpster, it's the same situation as last scenario. Um, we are making that a uniform rate in 2022. So again, you're seeing the same decrease 
to the multifamily that pay the residential rate. And again, the variable rate for to bring the multifamily um, rate pair, the multifamily paying the commercial rates to that uniform rate in 2022. Again, in this scenario, those those rate payers are, are not getting an increase beyond that for three years. Roll-offs, um, you, you need a 3% increase in 2022, zero in 23 and 24, and then a small increase of 1.5% in 2025. Commercial front and rear load, you would need a 7% increase starting in 2022 annually for this the next four years. Commercial carts, you would need a 5% increase annually for four years starting in 2022. Downtown, you would need a 10% increase annually for four years starting in 2022. And school and commercial cardboard recycling would be a 5% increase starting in 2022 for the next four years. And I, my little asterisk there didn't make it, so with the commercial cardboard. So taking the same net revenue look at this scenario, it looks very similar to the previous graph where you have, you know, all, all of our lines are very far apart in the beginning and they are getting very close by 2025. Our amount of deficit spending is a little bit more though in 2021 in this scenario, we are actually at a million dollars deficit spending in 2021. But again, we still are working towards the um, the zero goal in 2025. So this scenario achieves that goal. <clears throat> and scenario three. So this is a scenario where we looked at scenario one and we have the, the same increases for commercial and roll-off rates but we are also acknowledging the um, overpayment or over recovery of single family residential. So we're offsetting the total increase of the commercial and roll off rates with a reduction to single family and multifamily rates. So here you'd get a three and a quarter percent decrease to all single family residential customers in 2021, as well as multifamily customers that pay the single family rate. What that does to rates in the um, years after 2021 for single family, you would still have 0% increase in 2022 and 2023, but then you would need a small increase of 1.5% in 24 and 25. The multifamily folks paying the single family rate would, would get the re reduction along with the residential folks in 2021. So in 2022, it would just be less of uh, a decrease to get them to the uniform rate, but the total is the same. It would still get them to the same place in 2022. And then as in previous situations, multifamily paying the commercial rate would have a variable rate to come up to that or to come to that uniform rate as well. And again, in the same in all the scenarios, that new multifamily uniform rate would not have any rate increases for at least three years. And then the rates for the other uh, roll-off, commercial front and rear load, commercial cart downtown, recycling school and commercial on cardboard, those are gonna be, um, oh, Actually, no, they are different. Sorry, uh, the roll-off rates are 3% in 2021 and 2022. And then you uh, have a break, uh, no rate increases for 23 and 24, and then another 3% in 2025. Commercial front and rear load would be 5% in 2021, and then 6% annually for four years. Commercial cart would be 5% in 2021, and then 6% annually for four years. Downtown will be 5% in 2021, and then 10% annually for four years. And then recycling school and commercial cardboard would be 5% annually for all five years. So 
So the net revenue in this situation uh, is very similar to the previous uh, slide. However, the blue line for single family residential is much lower. So, um, you know, that had been over 600,000 with scenario one. Um, with the decrease in revenue, you can see it has dropped now to below $400,000. So um, you're getting the, the dip there. Um, the other lines would be very similar to the, the previous scenario. And again, the deficit spending it's very similar, um, actually cumulatively, it's it's almost identical to the scenario two um, amount of about $3 million over the five years. But again, all going towards that ultimate goal of being closer to zero in 2025. So looking at um, some area comparisons for residential rates, um, we see here that the Lawrence rates are highlighted there in that gold color. So the current 2020 rates are the same as the 2021 scenarios one and two, because this is, we're looking at residential rates and both of those scenarios have a 0% rate increase. And then your third option is there at 1873, because that is the 3.25% decrease option. And um, just to note that um, this is really just a general comparison of residential rates in the area. There really isn't a, a true apples to apples comparison with, with all of these communities. Um, there's such a variety in services that they offer. So um, some of them are not really exact to what the city of Lawrence offers. And then we have our solid waste summary. So here at the top table is our summary of uh, the three different scenarios for the 2021 specifically, just that year, that increase um, broken down by single family and multifamily uh, folks that pay the residential rate, commercial and multifamily that do pay the commercial rate, and then roll-offs. And that figure at the bottom line there, so that's the estimated uh, revenue that's going to be generated in each scenario in 2021. So when we set the maximum expenditures uh, back in July, and we had kind of capped that, uh, you know, we would do no more than a 3% uh, revenue increase to uh, fund the adopted budget. So that was at $426,000. So all of these scenarios are uh, well within that um, maximum authority. And then the bottom table there is a um, sort of a residential average cost. If you were to look at a resident single family residential rate with 65 gallon cart, which is what the, the previous slide with the comparisons were based on um, by scenario, it gives you the amount that that the rate payer would pay per month. And since commercial uh, varies so much by um, cart size and, and, and frequency, um, really the, the one rate that we can tell you is that uh, the commercial minimum rate of uh, 2420, that's, that's the Lawrence 2020 rate. We can give you that comparison. So in scenario one, that is a 5% increase. Scenario two, that's the 0%. And of course, in scenario three, that's the five, uh, percent increase again yeah and just to note that um, we can't really give an average for dumpster and roll-off rates because they're just uh, they vary so much so that is the uh, final slide for solid waste so i would break to see if we have any um, questions or comments from the commission Mayor Pinkley, any questions from the commission on that part? Seeing none, we can move ahead with the summary charts. Maggie Mahoney, Municipal, Municipal Services and Operations. Um, 
Thank you, Mayor. So uh, here we have the summary of scenario one. Again, just a reminder, scenario one is what is proposed in the ordinances that um, we will be taking action on shortly. So just to recap, stormwater and wastewater, scenario fund one fully funds the 2021 adopted budget and CIP. The solid waste, uh, scenario one allows rates to better align with cost of service. And then you have that slower decline to the, the fund balance in that scenario. So the bottom, the bottom table here, I've kind of taken all of those, the summary slides from the previous uh, presentations to sort of, uh, you know, try to get a look at what a residential bill may look like and what the impact would be with the scenario one situation. So for stormwater, you can see if the current 2020 rate of 450 with an increase of 225 per month, that would be an, uh, $27 a month. And then you have the same calculation for water and wastewater as well as solid waste. So your bottom line is, um, you know, if your if your bill is twenty in twenty twenty is one hundred and two dollars and fifty one cents, that could go up to one hundred and nine dollars and sixty eight cents in scenario one. One way to look at that is a seven dollars and seventeen monthly increase or an annual increase of eighty six dollars and four cents. On the, this is Commissioner Ananda, on the water and wastewater, are you, um, is this using the inclining block rate for the entire year? Could that look different um, considering a quarter of the year will remain how it is currently? Maggie Mahoney, Municipal Services and Operations. Um, yes, this, so this is showing the uniform rate. Um, so this is not showing inclining block. So yes, inclining block, uh, potentially would change um, how much uh, e each individual ratepayer would pay from that point um, based on that block structure. This is Commissioner Arnold again, thank you. Do you have any information on um, just taking into tier one consideration whether that would increase or decrease that annual or monthly amount? Um, Mike Lawless, Deputy Director for Municipal Services and Operations. Um, Commissioner Ananda, I, I don't know that we have enough data. One, because we haven't actually implemented that inclining block. I, I think in future years, we'll have better information to help answer that question. Um, you know, I would say for the customers that um, don't do a lot of discretionary watering, so lawn watering, um, uh, garden watering, that kind of thing, um, you know, they could potentially see a lower increase if they keep all of the usage in block one. Um, as you move up into the higher blocks, then um, that, uh, that amount will vary. And, and, you know, without having implemented it, I, I, we, we really don't have any data with which to base um, um, how the inclining block is, is going to vary um, over the course of a year. You know, in the, in the, in the colder months where we, there might not be a lot of outdoor watering or discretionary use, you're gonna be less because you're gonna be all in block one, where in the summer months, if you water um, outdoors or, you know, fill a swimming pool or, do a lot of, of car washing or that kind of thing, then you know you'll see a higher you'll see a higher um, bill in those months. Exactly how that averages over the course of a year, um, I, I I can't say. Commissioner Nanda, thank you. Commissioner Larson, I did have a, a question. Is there a reason why we're not seeing a graph that shows how these total utility rates compare with with surrounding communities? Maggie Mahoney, Management Analyst, Municipal Services and Operations. Um, I, I don't just I don't know if we thought of putting that in there. I know um, the commission received um, a presentation I think in towards the end of October that included some of that information, um, but we just uh, we didn't have we just didn't include it.
Maggie Mahoney, Management Analyst, Municipal Services and Operations. So um, that completes the formal presentation. And so now in just, uh, uh, you know, going over um, recapping what the proposed ordinances um, are with the scenario one um, situation of fully funding and conforming to the adopted 2021 budget and CIP um, ordinance 9801 for stormwater is proposing a 50% increase to the equivalent residential unit rate. And that is generated to estimate an additional $1.978 million of revenue in 2021. Ordinance 9800 for water and wastewater is proposing a seven and three quarter percent revenue increase. It's also proposing in implementing the individual declining block rates effective April 1, 2021. And that will generate an estimated additional $3.125 million of revenue in 2021 to support the budget. And Ordinance 9802 for solid waste is proposing a 2.7 overall revenue increase with a 5% increase for commercial services and 3% increase for roll-off services, which will generate an estimated $396,000 of revenue in 2021 to fund the adopted budget. Mayor Finkel, I thank you very much, Maggie, for that presentation, and Amber and Mike and Dave for the, the help. I'm sure we'll have more questions before this is over. Um, can you go ahead and stop sharing your screen, screen, please? And commissioners, do you have questions before we go to public comment? Commissioner Ananda. Commissioner Ananda, thank you. Um, I wanted to ask about um, particularly given the year that we've had and so many folks experiencing financial difficulties. I also want to just kind of have a conversation around what kind of billing assistance we are providing or intend to provide around this, um, the rounding up option and the status on that and how that's going. Is there anyone who can provide some information on those? Maggie Mahoney, Management Analyst for Municipal Services and Operations. Um, Commissioner Ananda, um, this isn't speaking to the Roundup program um, in particular, but I did want to mention that um, the proposed ordinances do include the low income and elderly rate updates. So there is that um, form of assistance is still um, included in the, the ordinances. Jeremy Wilmoth, Finance Director. Um, Commissioner Nada, as you mentioned, uh, we are in the process of starting that program uh, with the CARES Act funding that came in. Uh, we felt that was a higher priority. So um, once that program ends at the end of this month, we should get that roundup program started at the first of next year uh, so that anybody who would like to participate in their uh, roundup. Mayor, Mayor Finkel, like Jeremy, we kind of lost you there. Sorry. You're breaking up. I don't know if it's your microphone or not. Maybe. I don't know. Oh, I'm not getting a that's message. That's better. We can hear you now. Okay. I'm not getting a message. I have a bad signal, so I apologize. Um, Jeremy Wilmoth, well, finance director. I'm not. I'm not sure what you heard. <laughs> Mayor Finkel, we heard that you said you're going to start the program um, in January after the CARES fund run, runs out, but then we missed the rest. Okay. Um, Jeremy Wilmoth, Finance Director. So uh, the only other option that we have uh, for assistance for those that need it uh, is currently the Elderly Assistance Program. Um, we have sort of discussed internally about ways that we could expand that program really our difficulty with that is just not uh, we don't really have any way of knowing what the volume would be um we have data on who's currently applying but we don't have data on you know if we if we expand the eligibility by 10 percent, how many more people would apply if we expanded it by 50 etc so um we're working on some modest proposal uh increases that, that that we're going to recommend to you all uh the the one thing i do want to remind you of is because of our revenue bonds um this isn't something the water fund can pay for it's actually the general fund 
would have to make that payment on behalf of the customer so that the revenue that the uh, that we've promised to our, our bondholders uh, remains whole. So any program that we do propose will be an expenditure to the general fund, um, not just a reduction of revenue to the water fund, if that, uh, if that makes sense. Mayor Finkel, like Commissioner Lawson, did you have some questions? Yeah, I, yeah, I do. Um, just kind of look at it, at this as a uh, maybe just a larger picture. So, in our CAP from twenty twenty one to twenty twenty five, we've dedicated about twenty three million dollars to stormwater and um, about eighty eight million dollars to utilities over that those that five year period. So, the rates that are being proposed tonight. Um, including which includes um, well, obviously for 2021 but we also we also saw how it stretches out to 2025 based on those rates are we are, is that going to allow us to meet our commitment that we've we've um, put into our CIP over the next five years Jeremy well the finance director um, as uh, Maggie had indicated the fully funded option is the budget rate and then the uh, scenarios that were presented tonight would be um, a reduced rate, but then also a reduced impact to the CIP. Okay, I just, yeah, Commissioner Arson, thank you. I just wanted to make sure I heard that right. Um, um, and then also, I had another question. Um, I can't remember what it was. Um, I'll come back to it. Mr. Arts, I do remember now, and that is that uh, the, um, as we all know, one of the issues we've had is is the fact that we've kind of fallen down on our maintenance in the past numerous years. Does this start to turn that around and get us to the point where we're actually making headway in our maintenance and not just doing the bare minimum? Um, Dave Wagner, Director for Municipal Services and Operations. I'll, I'll try to answer that, Commissioner Larson, to, to the best that I can. I would tell you in the stormwater utility, there are still remain a lot of unknowns. And that's why our priority is, is to go out and identify those assets, do that condition assessment, find out where the infrastructure is at, and then start developing models that tell us what kind of capacity is there and what kind of maintenance needs do we need in that utility. So there's a lot of unknowns and some uncertainty there. So, um, but it certainly turns the corner. It, you know, I think we're, aggressive in the ninth in Mississippi and man if I'm wrong um, scream at me or something but we're being aggressive in that watershed specifically where we know we've had some issues um, and we're going to jump on that I think we can jump on that first and get that moving um, we're also on the maintenance side where it allows for some more operational funds where we can get some more uh, city staff in the field to start to do the the Monday door-to-door -door knock on uh, inlets and start fixing those inlets that you see are collapsed around town, you know, and hopefully in conjunction with some of the other asset improvements we're doing with corridor, whether that's ADA improvements or whatever that might be, as you can kind of tell, a lot of those inlets uh, involve other infrastructure as well. Um, so the hope is um, it'll start to do that thing I showed in that first graph we'll start to turn the corner, but it's gonna be a, a long haul approach. But I do believe with the asset management programs that the teams are doing, um, we'll get more and more refined and better and better about what those needs are. But in that specific utility, there are a lot of unknowns. On the, on the water and wastewater utility, we think we have a pretty good handle of what the assets are. And I think that reason we looked at water lines is we wondered if we had that or not. And the predictor model is kind of telling us that, yeah, I think we have that relatively well managed. So that's the goal. And I hope I've answered your question. I, I wished I could be more definitive, though. Commissioner Arson, thanks, Dave. I do, I do appreciate that. Um, can we just real briefly go back to one of the slides uh, under waste? This is just as an example, wastewater and um, water scenario one. The slide that shows the um, program predictor model yeah go back there we go just as an example so 
Um, are we seeing there that the, the green obviously is, is the, um, the, the better, um, it's better and the, and, and the red abodes to the amount of maintenance we've got to do, is that, is that what I'm still understanding? Uh, Amber Schultz, General Manager of uh, Municipal Services and Operations. Um, so what you're seeing here is the expected remaining useful life. Um, okay. You know, we have a lot of water mains that are um, installed in different years, made of different material. Um, so we did some calculations on what our expected life would be for mm -hmm. um, those assets and then um, basically just derive the expected remaining useful life from that. Okay. So the expected useful life, um, obviously you figure over time that the, the life obviously would go down, expected life would go down. So the red bars at, at the top there, that indicates that um, the life is getting shorter. Is that what I'm reading? Uh, Amber Schultz, uh, General Manager of Municipal Service and Operations. Yes, so the, the, the ones at the very top in dark red would be considered failed. Um, whether that's, you know, um, from, you know, the variety of criteria that we use. So that could be age, number of breaks, um, soil um, um, corrosion um, parameters on those. And then the, the lighter red is um, uh, a likely break likelihood of, I believe, 10% um, annually, um, along with less than, I think it's 10% 10, 10 of don't quote me on that. I don't have the, the model right in front of me of remaining useful life um, okay. expected. Okay. okay. Thank you, Commissioner Archer. Thank you, Amber. Appreciate that. Mayor Fingal, I have other questions before we open it up to public comment. Seeing none, I'd go ahead and open this to public comment. If you are on Zoom and you'd like to speak, please raise your hand using the raise your hand function. And if you're in person, please let Sherry or Porter know. This is Sherry Riedemann, City Clerk. We have one individual um, present who would like to speak. And um, you can go ahead. Yeah, I just want to say that <clears throat> I can tell you guys are trying to reduce the cost for people and for businesses in this solid waste or water waste. Uh, this is Mayor Finkel, I just for the record, Hyde, this is Mr. Hyde, correct? All right, Eric Hyde, sorry. Uh, no, you're good. But <clears throat> I just have to say that I don't agree with it. And... Uh, especially multiple families going out of a dumpster, they don't really have a choice where they put their trash. I mean, they're paying rent and this is only gonna punish them by getting them more higher rent. As far as businesses, I don't agree with it either. They're already suffering through this illness. Uh, they're already having reduced incomes. Stop charging people more money I appreciate that you're trying to charge them less, but just stop charging the money in the first place. That's all. Mayor Finkley, Sherry, is there anyone else who'd like to speak? No, Mayor. Okay, we'll bring it back up to the commission for discussion or additional questions. I'll just go ahead and jump in and ask a, a few questions. Um, really some clarifications for myself. Am I correct when we, the maximum we said in the budget would have been, I think, $103 increase. And if we go with scenario one tonight, we're looking at a $86 increase. Is that correct? So we're, we're off the maximum we set earlier this summer, correct? Maggie Mahoney, Management Analyst, Municipal Services and Operations. Um, yes, we are um, 
under the maximum for water and wastewater. We had predicted 8% uh, back in July, so we were at 7.75 uh, overall general re revenue increase there. And then um, the reduction to uh, solid waste, that that's a reduced amount as well. So yes, we are we're under the maximum amount. Mayor Fingold, I, I would just note, I appreciate that. <laughs> you came in um, lower than, than the maximum. That is a certainly an appreciated um, item. Second question I had was um, related to, you know, I, we've, I've been trying to follow these last couple months since COVID hit that seems like a lot of our um, CIP type items have been coming in below the engineer's estimate, meaning we've been getting some really good um, bids on projects. And I assume that's because there's not as many projects to, to bid on. Um, obviously we can't predict the future, but a, a lot of these um, 2021 in particular items all um, in 2022, the CIP, especially in wastewater, water and wastewater, all bonded projects, right? These are large projects. So if they do come in under budget, we're going to see some significant savings. Is that correct? Mike Lawless, Deputy Director for MSO. Uh, Mayor Finkeldye, yes. I mean, each year we look at what projects are on the CIP. Um, we'll use the um, authorizing resolution in order to, to be able to bond those. And then, you know, we'll look at the dollars that we, that we sell um, for those bonds. And if we use less than that, then that would free up dollars for um, the next year's CIP um, or that we wouldn't have to um, maybe sell as much, uh, uh, as many bonds or as much bonds uh, the following year. Um, you know, that's kind of how we look at it is, um, you know, one of the things is we don't want to sell more bonds than we need to because then, you know, we're just sitting on dollars. Um, and, you know, if we don't use it, then we have the arbitrage issue that we have to be cognizant of. And so, you know, what we're trying to do is, is balance that what do we think we need for the next um, 12 to 15 months um, so that we can spend that? If, if projects come in under, then that would leave dollars available that we could use in the next year's CIP, um, assuming that they fit the projects that were authorized in the resolution. And at that point, then we would just um, look at how many, how much extra or how many dollars that we need to complete the next year's CIP, and then we would already have somewhat of a head start, you could say. Mayor Finkel, I thank you on that. And I know we're not really setting any rates beyond 2021, but I was looking at, as you went through the solid waste, the downtown rates had some, you know, 10% increases every year for four or five years, which, um, seems pretty stiff, but I guess I'm not sure where they're going from and where they're going to. Can, can you talk about kind of what, what kind of rates they're paying? Uh, Maggie Mahoney, Municipal Services and Operations uh, Management Analyst. So um, the downtown rate is another rate that it varies. So it's gonna vary on the business size and type so there is a lot of variance within that, um, you know, small businesses to very, very large um, special classifications for like the Eldridge Hotel. And um, so it's, it's a very complex uh, rate structure for the downtown rates, which is why we left it as is the actual structure. Um, but in terms of cost recovery, um, it, you know, those, you're seeing those bigger increases to um, really recover those, those, the cost it actually takes to um, provide those services for that. Um, so I can't give you a, a more specific number, unfortunately, um, at this time, but I would say, um, you know, as perhaps as we develop the model further, we'd be able to get some better data um, to capture some of that information um, about those rates. Mayor Finkel, I, I appreciate that. And I guess I think is, you know, again, it kind of looked like we'd in, in four or five years, we have a 50% rate increase. So certainly I think that's something we want to engage our downtown businesses in and, and certainly um, 
you know, maybe look at ways that, well, that's obviously the cost we're trying to recover it, but is there ways we can reduce the cost or the ways the downtown business owners can join together and, and come up with ways to reduce the cost so we can bring down the overall cost so they don't have those same increases. Again, I know that's coming. I know that's not really an issue for tonight, but I just want to um, hope that you're going to look at that in the future. Um, last, remember my last question here. Um, this is for St. Andrew Owens. So I recall when you came in and you gave your little talk as you assessed the the city, one of the, the issues you talked about was infrastructure and the state of our infrastructure. And I just wondered if, if you would um, comment on that and how you think this plan we're talking about tonight moves us forward. Yeah, thanks, Mayor. Uh, city Manager Craig Owens. Um, I think uh, Mr. Wagner heard me say that too, um, that uh, our infrastructure needs some love. And I, you know, I think those are my outside eyes uh, looking at it as we've de delved into uh, our infrastructure in, in various ways. These are the utilities that we're talking about tonight. The stormwater you don't see as much, but you can experience. Um, and, and the roads, the roads are the ones that people see and they're obvious about. So while we're not talking about all of our infrastructure here tonight, uh, we certainly um, are talking about a big chunk and a lot of this is underneath the ground. And uh, while some of it I think has been, has been ma maintained uh, uh, systematically um, a little bit better than some of the other stuff. Uh, this is all part of a big commitment we have to getting back on track and so that we get achieve that lowest cost of ownership uh, over time, which is going to save people money in the long run. But we need to get into a cycle and a system and a routine so that we, we achieve those those kinds of expectations. And by the way, then uh, it's it's having these side effects, not just that we're managing a system uh, that it has a lower overall cost for us, but it's a higher level of service. Um, there was one outstanding statistic that uh, still sticks with me when we were kind of, I was kind of getting to know some of our departments. And that was that, um, you know, we, we used to measure uh, annual um, basement backups in the hundreds a year and that people would experience that, some who had never experienced uh, backups in their basements. Uh, and you can imagine whatever might be stored in, in the basement or the impact that that might have. And now we're, we're down to um, just a few a year, which is too many, but it's, it's a dramatic reduction. And that shows you what kind of investment impact this can have on individual homeowners and, uh, and community members. So, you know, this is, yes, this is all part of a very important and con uh, a conscious uh, effort to try and arrest kind of these neglect neglected areas and definitely get us into a posture for the future so that we are having, experiencing quality infrastructure that doesn't have a disparate impact on uh, low to moderate income homes and low-lying areas in, um, and the people that are much more dependent on some of the basics and the basic utilities that are here. So yes, all of this is part of that plan. The CIP was a, a bigger conversation that we had during the budget and, and this definitely aligns directly with that. Mayor Finkelberg, thank you. Those are the questions I had for the moment. I did have a request to take a short break. So maybe if we take a 10 minute break, we'll come back with questions, discussion, and, and then eventually a vote. So we'll take a 10 minute break.
All set. Ojo, are you ready? We are ready, Mayor. Mayor Finkel died. We're back from our break. I'll take a quick roll call. Vice Mayor Shipley? Here. Commissioner Ananda? Here. Commissioner Bully? Here. Commissioner Lawson? Here. Okay, we are all here and back from break. And we are continuing with questions or discussion. Who would like to go next? Mayor Bingle died. If we have no questions, you want to start the conversation off. This is Commissioner Ananda. I think that I will mention some of the kind of factors that I'm taking into my thoughts on this um, <clears throat> as we look at moving forward. I think that we obviously our residents are suffering economically and those assistance programs are really important to me. So I would want in conjunction with any of these scenarios um, and even in general for us to continue to expand <clears throat> the options that we have for assistance for folks who have lower incomes in addition to aging individuals with lower in incomes. Um, I also, I think that once we get the roundup option started that will have an impact as well and hopefully um, that will be wildly successful and we will be able to balance those two projects sufficiently to um, to feel comfortable with any decision that we make for a rate increase. Um, I also think it's very important as um, as Craig mentioned you know getting caught up on our infrastructure projects and um, it would be negligent, in my opinion, of us to um, <clears throat> not prioritize that um, for the same reason, you know, caring for our residents, particularly those who have lower incomes, um, because the costs of those aren't going to go down, um, and more likely than not, they will increase. And so we are also doing even by doing a service now, if we reduce the amount of the rate increase, we're doing a disservice in the long term <clears throat> because those costs are going to be higher. And we know that income is not rising at the same level that um, construction costs are. And so those I think are pretty important considerations for me and they feel like they're opposing, but I don't, I don't think that they are because I think they're all moving toward our long-term goals of providing services for our residents, um, providing equitable costs um, and, and services for folks who can't necessarily afford it and reducing those costs in the long term. Mayor Fingal, anyone want to go next? So, you know, and jumping up and down, I guess I will uh, um, say a couple things. I, I agree with um, Commissioner Ananda. And, you know, as as we entered in um, to the year, um, you know, we talked a lot about infrastructure and getting our infrastructure set up and we worked hard on that CIP. And I think, although it's a, it's a painful step, I think we've identified some very important projects here that need to be worked on, in particular on the stormwater. You know, um, the stormwater, as we saw, has been long neglected in, in raising the rates, and we have some serious issues that we need to address. And I know one of those um, is the Ninth of Mississippi, that whole watershed coming down off the campus and, and down towards downtown. It is a serious issue. Um, and Anything other than scenario one, we have a very difficult time 
funding that project and I certainly it's something I think um, I support but more so than that project um, is this project as Mr. Wagner talked about to really start to identify where our needs are um, you know we all know that we've had some flooding events especially in 2019 that caused some serious issues around town and again those disparately impact um, individuals and so to get that under control and and uh, with certainly the prediction that we'll have more such um, weather events to be able to start to get a handle on that I think is important so to me the, the stormwater vote is is easy um, as we talk about solid waste um, I'd be interested to see what the commissioners think on that um, although I appreciate scenario one and, and might be able to get behind that um, I'm kind of interested to see what folks think about either scenario two, um, which would push off the, the rates on commercial um, customers and in this time that is a tough year and uh, maybe push that off for a year. And it looks like with fund balances and, and with the plan we have going forward, that might be something we could do. Um, again, I'm not opposed to scenario one, but I'm interested to see what folks think about scenario two. Obviously, the water and wastewater is the biggest item, um, you know, dollar-wise, um, and, and the amount it goes up. Um, but again, when you look at the projects that are on that list, and the projects we might not be able to fund if we if we go with some of the lower rates, um, you know, um, these are projects I think we, we we probably need to do, and we need to to get on quickly. And we'll see a, a long-term benefit and uh so um i'm probably leaning towards scenario one on that one as well but um, i do also agree with commissioner nanda on the low income assistance and the roundup um, um project i think that's going to, to help and of course the chaos money is helping this year as well so these are things we need to look at so um that's kind of where i'm leaning at the moment but certainly be open to discussion from the other commissioners. Commissioner Larson, I'll go ahead and pipe in here. Um, you know, I echo what um, Commissioner Nanda had said about the utilities assistance program, that it, it is something that we definitely need to stay on top of and continue to implement it to the fullest extent possible. That's, um, that, that, to me, that's part of this package, which you've outlined is, is part of the ordinances too. Um, I don't, uh, scenario one across the board, uh, you know, it, it's obviously those, the needs are there. They, what I appreciate about this, this presentation was the fact that they really tied the CIP to these to the to the rate change needs in very big, very good detail, and I appreciate that very much. Um, so you know, it's the scenario one and two, um, whether we go with one and two is solid waste. I don't have uh, any preference on that. Um, no overriding preference for for one or the other. Um, I would definitely support definitely support one, and I would be willing to open to supporting two also. Um, what I'm going to, what I want to watch for in the future here is how we actually um, implement our CIP over the next five years, given these, it, given these rate changes that, that are being proposed, because what I'm hearing is that there's a commitment to, to actually um, doing the projects that are outlined in our CIP, and that's going to be a strong indicator to me as to how successful we are with this program. Mayor Pinkle, I um, appreciate those comments and, and, and certainly agree with them. I would I forgot to add one thing as I looked at my notes um, is that, again, I mentioned this in my questions, but I appreciate that um, when we were talking about this earlier, we looked at a maximum rate of $103 on average, and now we're down to $86 as an increase. And obviously any increase um, people will see, but I appreciate the the work of staff to, to come in, refine, you know, sharpen their pencils as it were, and come in with, with lower rates than we set in the maximum. I think a lot of people, um, at least a few people told me, well, once you set as a maximum, that's just what it's going to be. You're just going to rubber stamp it later. Um, and so to see that number to come down, um, I appreciate, appreciate the work of staff.
Commissioner Bully, Vice Mayor Shipley, either one. Mr. Commissioner Bowley, I really appreciate the, the work the staff has done on this, and I appreciate the comments of my fellow commissioners. Um, you've done a very good job of expressing where I think we, we are and where we need to be. Um, I think it's really important that we focus on infrastructure. Uh, these are the assets that our community owns and the future of our community depends on how well we manage and care for these assets. Um, the lowest cost of ownership is a goal that we need to put forward because, you know, that's how we can serve our community well. I think it's also important to appreciate that costs need to be allocated accurately. I think that's one of the places we've kind of fallen down in the past. And I appreciate the, all the work that's gone into identifying the components of cost and allocating them to the users. And I think that it's important to note that, you know, this has shown that our residential customers have been, you know, paying more than their fair share for solid waste where the commercial customers have been paying less. And overall, we have, we're running a deficit. So as we change, make changes going forward, it's important not to overburden the residential customers. Um, I guess for that reason, I'd say if we're not gonna do number one, we probably ought to think seriously about number three on the solid waste. Um, Again, this focus on infrastructure is very significant and um, we need to um, support the work that staff's doing to provide service to our, to our community. Thanks. Um, Vice Mayor Shipley, I, I agree with uh, Commissioner Boley on um, his comments about um, the cost being allocated accurately. And so I think maybe there I'd like to hear more from the mayor. I've, I think I felt the same way about the solid waste number one option that you did about um, uh, stormwater uh, number one option. So I wondered if I could tease out a little bit um, you're leaning towards number two. I think that you, you're talking about on solid waste, you lean towards number three instead of number two? Or? I, I was leaning toward number one, Commissioner Sh sorry, Vice Mayor Shipley. Well, Mayor Finkeldai, I was only, again, um, you know, we have a, obviously we're def deficit spending, but we have a fairly large balance there. And certainly given this year, um, you know, look like scenario two would fully fund our operations, still leave us with a balance, but maybe would give a break in 2021 to some of our commercial um, and, you know, rate payers, um, not to see an increase where they're going to see an increase in other places. I, I certainly don't, I mean, I, I, mean I, I hear what Commissioner Bully is saying as well. Um, you know, option three is certainly on the table. It does give a decrease to the residential folks. Um, doesn't have the obviously have the same impact on commercial, so I think I, I'm I'm probably open to all, all three of those. I don't feel incredibly strongly about it, but I guess um, maybe if we could do a little bit to help, and, and and it doesn't appear from the staff's presentation, we could really go wrong with either either of any of those three options. So unlike, you know, wastewater and water and and stormwater, if we took the other options, we're going to see some you know, lack of CIP, lack of service, but I think in, in, in solid waste, we can have a high level of service. And so really that's more of just a discussion of how we, we allocate that. So I'm, I, I'd like to have that discussion. This is Commissioner Ananda and, you know, a million years ago or three years ago when I first got on the commission, we were talking about um, 
about solid waste rates for downtown. So I know that that is something that we've been thinking about, um, particularly staff has been thinking about for quite some time. And I appreciate that they've developed a plan to make that um, move toward where it needs to be. So, you know, I also hear that our, our small businesses are sort of concentrated downtown and there has been an impact on them. Um, for the last several years. I think that I'm hesitant to have, and, and I'm, I'm willing to hear counter arguments for sure, but in scenario three, where we have a single family residential reduction, and then we're increasing it um, in 2024 and 2025, um, I don't wanna make assumptions about what 2024 and 2025 are going to be like. Um, and it maintaining zero across there for me, feels more satisfactory than a reduction and then an increase um, over time at this point. Mayo Finkeldai, though, well, we have a, a couple options here. Option, um, it sounds like we might have some pretty good agreement on one and two, so we could go ahead and maybe take a motion and, and pass one and two, and then talk a little bit about, about three, um, which have a little more discussion on that. That might narrow the issues. Just a suggestion if anyone's willing to make that motion. This is Commissioner Ananda. I move that we adopt on first reading ordinance number 9801. That's for the, excuse me, Commissioner Austin, isn't that for the stormwater? Is that? Oh, it is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Are we done having that discussion? <laughs> I'm hearing maybe not. Yeah, we're, uh, Commissioner Austin, yeah, I, I just wanted to make sure I was on the right page here. Yeah. Um, I, I heard, this is Commissioner Ananda, I heard uh, Mayor say number one and two. Um, yes, I just wanted to make sure we were done with discussion on that. So I will I will leave that motion in play. Commissioner Arson, I second that. Mayor Finkel died. There is a motion by Commissioner Ananda and a second by Commissioner Lawson to adopt 98.1 as written, which for the record is scenario one. Any other discussion before I move to a vote? Commissioner Ananda. Aye. Commissioner Lawson. Aye. Vice Mayor Shipley. Aye. Commissioner Bully. Aye. Mayor Finkel, aye. aye. Um, <clears throat> passes five to zero. Is there a motion on? Agenda item two. Commissioner Larson, I uh, move to adopt on first reading orders number 9800. Commissioner Ananda, second. Mayor Fingle, there is a motion by Commissioner Lawson, a second by Commissioner Ananda to approve ordinance 9800, which for the record is scenario one. Any discussion before we move to a vote? This is Sherry Riedemann, City Clerk. I, just so I'm clear, that is not solid waste. Is that? Yeah, we'll, uh, we'll adopt these other two. This, the second one is what, 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 okay. water and wastewater. I just wanted to make sure I was clear on the discussion that happened prior to. Thank you. Yeah. Mayor Finkel, I thank you for that clarification. And then we'll go ahead and take a vote on um, the pending motion. Commissioner Lawson. Sorry, you froze. Commissioner, Commissioner Larson, you froze. Is, did you ask for my vote? I did. Sorry. Commissioner Larson, yeah. Commissioner Ananda. Aye. Vice Mayor Shipley. Aye. Commissioner Bully. Aye. Mayor Finkel, aye. Aye. Um, Jen item two passes five to zero. Now that brings us to agenda item three. 
And I think we do want to have a little more discussion on, on the three scenarios there. Or, um, again, I'm, I'm pretty open to them. I guess I'm leaning towards scenario two, as I said, but I'm, I'm open to discussion. And obviously, other thoughts. Just Commissioner Bully, can we put um, the second uh, option up on the screen so I can take a look at it again, please? This is the commissioner. This is Commissioner Nada. I, I think that the thing that I struggle with on on scenario two is the 2025 1.5 percent increase, and I know that's not what we're voting on this year. Um, I acknowledge that, but it does it doesn't move that single family residential line more toward that zero balance um, as close as the other scenarios did. So I think that is my hesitation. Around this one, I understand why it's in there because we are doing across the board zero percent increases for the others. This Commissioner Bowley, um, I'm concerned that um, this essentially puts in uh, or continues the uh, inaccurate cost allocation. Um, and, and I think we need to make steps forward in actually putting costs where they, they need to be, um, rather than keeping family, single family residential at zero. If, if we're going to try to make a change, we either need to raise the commercial or we need to lower the single family. So Commissioner Arson, let me clarify with you, um, Commissioner Bowley. So you're more, obviously scenario number three is, is what do you find most uh, appealing, but you're, you're saying either scenario one or three, is that what you're saying? As I understand it, scenario one and scenario three both make changes that take us towards more accurate cost allocation. Okay. And you know, if we if we say it's it's hard times for businesses, they shouldn't have to raise their rates. We should also say it's it's hard times for families, and they shouldn't have to overpay. Yeah. This is Commissioner Ananda. I would be willing to um, consider a scenario one or or scenario three over scenario two, personally. Um, for the very reason that Commissioner Bully just mentioned. Commissioner Arson, I, I would I would agree after hearing that. Um, I didn't I didn't really think about that as far as balancing and, and trying to make sure we allocate the um, costs where they need to be or the the um, um, yeah. So so I would also be open to either one or three at this point. Commissioner Arson, probably more towards one than I would three. Vice Mayor Shibley, Mayor, I think maybe you were leaning towards three. Do you, now that we've had that discussion, do you lean one way or the other? Mayor Fingal, I'm still thinking about that. Between one and three, which one I like, I like more. Mr. Commissioner Bully, I'm okay with one. This is Commissioner. I think scenario one provides more predictability for residents. Um, I certainly am not opposed to reducing the rate for residents, but I do not like that it would include an increase later. Um, and knowing how difficult those discussions are around residential rate increases, um, I just see that as something that you know, maybe, maybe we will all be here in five years and maybe we will not. Um, 
having having commitment to that plan is not something that we are we're not making that commitment this evening um and so i think that talking future rate increases on solid waste for um our residential customers will be very difficult Um, you can take this down now, Ms. Commissioner Bowley. I'm, I'm happy with it. Thank you. Mayor Finkelberg, um, Vice Mayor Shipley, do you, you have a comment? Or are we ready for a motion? Uh, uh, Vice Mayor Shipley, uh, like yourself, I was on the edge there. Um, I, yeah, I feel like I'm going to go with my original feeling, which was to lean towards um, scenario number one. Mayor Finkel, I think we'll head in that direction. I guess I'm, I certainly understand Commissioner Bully's arguments, and I'm torn between that and, and trying to get a um, a little bit of reprieve for some of our customers, but I certainly understand the argument with scenario three. Um, so I guess I'd probably lean to scenario three over scenario one, but um, sounds like we have a little more consensus on scenario one. So certainly be looking for a motion maybe, move this ahead. Commissioner Larson, I moved. To move to adopt ordinance number 9802 on the first reading. Commissioner Nanda, second. Mayor Finkel, I, we have a motion by Commissioner Lawson, a second by Commissioner Ananda on agenda item three. Um, and for the record, that's scenario one. Commissioner Lawson? Aye. Commissioner Ananda? Aye. Vice Mayor Shipley? Aye. Commissioner Bowley? Aye. Mayor Finkel, die. I'll go ahead and vote no on that and passes four to one. Thank you very much, staff, for the great work. I know you've done a lot of work on that, and um, there is a lot of work to do. Um, I know you will continue on the CIP projects as well as these rate models. So we really appreciate I at least do, and I know that other commissioners do some of these new uh, modeling you're showing us and, and the, the work you did to give us these options to consider. Um, I know you did a lot of work on that and we went ahead and mainly adopted scenario one, but, but I think seeing those really helped make that decision easier for us. So appreciate your hard work on that. Thank you very much. I think we're ready to move to commission items. Do we, does any commissioner have any future agenda items? Uh, Mayor, this is uh, Vice Mayor Shipley. Um, I wanted to point out that we received um, some correspondence from uh, the Ka Nation regarding what's commonly referred to as the Big Red Rock. Um, I'm not sure where it is in our packet, but um, uh, this is something that uh, and maybe Craig remembers even I think the first time I ever met him uh, was something that was on my list of things I wanted to um, see um, some movement on. So I was very glad to see this correspondence. Um, their letter um, requests the unconditional return of the rock. Um, and in addition to just asking how uh, this will move forward, Mayor, besides a letter that I think you will be writing. Um, just some items I wanted to forward to staff, whichever member of staff is, is responsible for moving this forward. Just some things that I thought I'd like to see in the conversation. Um, uh, and, you know, in, in the, I think it's been at least a year that this has been a community conversation. Um, one thing I'd like to see is working with some, um, I mean, you know, I can think of at least two uh, community partners that have the expertise and the heavy equipment uh, to move an object like this. Um, so I would like to see us engaging um, with them. Um, uh, I'd also um, 
like to you know sort of suggest that um, uh, you know each of us has different connections and and different constituencies in our community. I hope that we can kind of take this opportunity, each of us, to reach out for education and um, you know kind of make this a learning moment for um, our community. Um, and you know, if necessary, fundraising. I don't currently see where um, the city might be able to fund that, but I'm looking forward to anything that staff might say about that. Um, uh, some partners I'd like to see in the conversation, um, obviously besides the Cod Nation and their representatives is the county, it's the county's park. Um, and um, uh, the school district even, although they don't have any particular financial interest, again, it's a learning moment for our community. And in addition to having uh, indigenous women on the school board, um, I think it's an opportunity for school kids and school teachers to uh, think about colonization and the place that it holds in our, in our history. Um, and um, uh, the one thing they didn't mention in their letters specifically was sort of in, in addition to um, having stolen their um, prayer rock, we've attached a plaque to it and how we can safely remove that or what we need to do about that. That wasn't specifically mentioned in the letter, but I think we need to uh, make space in our conversation for that. Um, some, you know, some other partners, obviously Haskell, I don't know how many people at Haskell staff or students are called specifically, but still they might be really interested in the conversation with the community. Um, I was also thinking about maybe Justice Matters. They focus a lot on restorative justice, and although this isn't specifically about police or jail, it is still a restorative justice discussion and it seems like they might have some interest in that. Or even, you know, if, if fundraising is something we're going to need to do, um, the Douglas County Community Foundation uh, might be a good partner in that space also. Um, um, so yeah, those were some things I wanted to throw at staff. Um, uh, I, I think this is really um, a, an important um, item where we can, um, you know, engage our indigenous neighbors and um, show that we're serious about um, some of the things we've been talking about over the last year. So I, I, I don't know where the other commissioners on this, but um, uh, I. This is something I've been seriously interested in for a long time, and I hope that you'll all join me in uh, finding ways we can make this happen um, in a timely way and, and ask staff, you know, how long it will take for them to come back with us some suggestions on how we can move forward. This is Commissioner Larson. I did have, a, when we got that letter, I thought that was a, um, yeah, that was an interesting letter. I, I did have a question. Do we own that land? If we don't own it, do we have the right to... <clears throat> to say what, where the rock goes, or is this a county question? Vice Mayor Shipley, you. Vice Mayor Shipley, um, uh, as, as I said, I went, I went to a, um, a um, community conversation about this and, and I've talked also with some um, county commissioners my understanding is that indeed the rock resides within a county park, but my understanding is the rock belongs to the city. I, I want to clarify, in my opinion, the rock does not belong to the city. The rock belongs to the call people, and that's the conversation. But um, and if you're asking in the sort of... Um, legal legal terms I think is what you're asking uh, that's my understanding um, again the importance of working with our partners at the county um, I don't want to speak for anyone but my understanding is that there's a lot of um, unity on the feeling that that this is um, a healthy way to move forward and a good way to address this and so um, obviously needing to Im invite the county to have this discussion uh, to me the real question isn't isn't 
who the park belongs to or who the rock belongs to, but how we're going to raise the funds to move it safely. Um, to, I believe they would like it to be a council grove. It's about an hour and a half away. How we can um, do that. Um, I don't believe they bear, they should bear any cost at all whatsoever for that. That's on us. Um, so that's the real discussion that I, I, I'm looking for. This is Commissioner Ananda, um, Vice Mayor. I wanna thank you for bringing this up. Um, it was something that I also wanted to bring. So I don't have anything to add further than what you said. I certainly appreciate the language that you're using around this. And I think it's a really important conversation. And I agree with you um, that this this request should be should be met and we should be talking about how we're going to do that. Mayor Pinkle, I know we obviously got the letter just earlier this week and I am meeting with a couple of the representatives. They asked me to meet on Thursday and we'll have a little fuller discussion. And certainly this is the point, as Vice Mayor Shipley said, that we are asking to put this on future agenda to make sure we know where we're going. And I'm sure staff, I know is already working on this and we'll continue to work on this and we'll put that on a future agenda. So thank you for bringing that up. And it is going to be a great conversation, an important conversation and, and uh, figuring out how we how we proceed for sure. So thank you for that. Um, any other comments on that or other agenda items? I did have one item. I. Um, I know that as, well, I was, I was reminded as mayor that I'm now on the library board um, because the mayor sits on the library board. And I don't know if we historically review the list of committees folks are on in off election years, or do we try to keep that constant? And, the, and, and that is the only position that changes. So I didn't know if we needed to look at that um, item of, com of committees or not, um, someone with more experience could give me a heads up on that. This Commissioner Bully, uh, this crossed my mind uh, as well. And frankly, I'm very content to continue with my assignments. Um, but if you wish to uh, modify so that you're not overburdened with the addition of the library post, then I'm open to that. Mayor Finkelday, I'm I'm okay with the, the commission, you know, the, the items I'm on, but maybe we want to to bring it, let's maybe just put it on an agenda and have a, a short discussion maybe next week. And so everyone can can weigh in on that. Yeah. Commissioner Ananda, is that okay? You yeah. look like you. Commissioner Austin, I'm fine with that. Yeah, just to take a look at, at where we're all at with that, but uh, I'm also comfortable with what I'm doing and more than willing to help out in other areas if, if necessary. Commissioner Bull, I'm happy to have that conversation next week. Thank you. Commissioner Ananda as well. I think that um, both of those things are fine. The library Award is very fun. Enjoy that. Mayor Finkel, I thank you for that. We'll just put that on the agenda next week. Um, any other agenda items? Work session items? Other items? Seeing none, we'll move to the city manager report. Thank you, Mayor. City manager Craig Owens. Uh, there's three items uh, that we presented there tonight. Um, the um, future work session items, and happy to entertain any comments uh, on that one. The uh, sales tax report is in there, um, another update of kind of where we stand um, compared to where we expected to be and where we were last year. And um, then a memo that we had talked about <clears throat> providing to you and a kind of a status update on uh, the winter shelter program and kind of uh, some of the things that are happening in the, in the community uh, related to responding to some uh, people that are experiencing houselessness in our community. We are happy to answer any questions that you may have. Mayor Finkel Dye, um, Brandon, could you, I mean, I know we, we submitted the request and it looks like from the memo, maybe we're hoping to have something in place by December 24th, but where are we at that process? Have we issued an RFP? Do we know if we have the money? That sort of thing. 
Yes, thank you, Mayor. Uh, Brandon McGuire, Assistant, Assistant City Manager. Uh, we, we have, um, so, so with this program, we are working very closely with the Lawrence Community Shelter. Um, we're sensitive to the fact that they are running a, a voucher program um, with CARES Act, Act funds. And as we all know, um, and as Jeremy is firing off emails at this very moment about it, those funds expire um, at the end of this month, December 30th, actually. And so um, that program is limited. Uh, we, we have, um, we're timing our program uh, to start right at the same time that their program is ending um, so that it's as seamless as possible for at minimum the num the, the um, guests of that LCS community or that voucher program. Um, so so the, the date is um, somewhat flexible, but it's going to be roughly sometime between December 24th and uh, December 31st. Um, and some of that will also depend on uh, the work that we do with the selected property as well um, to, to be able to, to make sure that we've got rooms ready for people to move into immediately. Um, we do have an RFP uh, that is uh, being adver advertised currently. Um, that is a rolling, um, it's, it's kind of a rolling um, uh, RFP, meaning that, that um, as uh, competitive proposals come in, uh, we're going to start talking to those hotels. And I can tell you that we have received a handful of proposals. Um, the hotels have been very responsive and I, I definitely need to credit um, our friends at Explore Lawrence, um, Michael and, and Kendra, who helped uh, generate um, some, some interest with the hotels and make some connections there. Um, so we re really appreciate the work that they did for us there. Uh, we've got some proposals that, uh, that we're, we're um, pretty confident about. It gives us confidence that we think that we're gonna be able to meet our goal of sheltering up to 80 people um, and do that on the budget that we have through the ESG program, uh, which is a $250,000 budget. And not just um, shelter those, those individuals, but actually support them with staff, um, support them with food and um, some case management and uh, uh, try to get to work on helping them Mayor Fingold, I think we lost you there at the end, Brandon. Um, and it's going to be fast. And sorry, sorry about that. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can, Brandon. Go ahead. Okay. I mean, I am getting most that. Okay. Well, I, I think I think you caught you caught what I was trying to communicate. Yeah, Mayor Fingold, I thank you and 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 appreciate the work on this. I think it's a it's a big need and 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 just to be clear, the the hope. Well, the expectation is not only will this fund some of the people currently in the program through LCS and the CARES Fund, that we will go beyond that and be able to house additional people than we are currently being able to house, correct? Assistant City Manager Brandon McGuire, that is correct. Um, for for reference, we, we think that we're going to be able to get around 50 rooms. It could be a little bit more than that. Um, currently, the LCS voucher program is housing 68 individuals, at last count last week, 68 individuals in 38 rooms. Um, and so with 50 rooms, that would, I think, get us closer to what our original goal was of 80. Um, so we're, we're excited about that, but we certainly acknowledge that that's, that's still not meeting the total need in the community. Mayor Finkel, I understand, and, and certainly we'll continue to, to work on those efforts in multiple ways. And as we get people housed, of course, the goal is to house people so they get out of the hotel and we can put more people in um, as they get housed. And there's several programs working on that, Family Promise, Tens to Homeowners, both getting CARES money now and ESG money with what we approved tonight to continue those programs. So obviously, as those programs work, the goal, again, is not to keep people in the hotels, but to get them out permanently housed and then bring more people in as we can. So I know that's certainly what the whole community is working on and I appreciate your part of, of that, Brandon. That's absolutely correct. Mayor Fingal, I other questions for Brandon or comments for the city manager before we open it to public comment? Seeing none, um, is there any, if, if if anyone wishes to speak on this, I'm not sure anyone's left on the Zoom, but raise your hand or if someone's in person, let Sherry know.
Uh, this is Sherry Riedemann, City Clerk. Mayor, we have one individual here who would like to speak to this item. Um, you can go ahead and come forward and state your name. You have three minutes. Eric Hyde. <clears throat> I think it's great you guys are doing this extra hotel stuff. Um, but you said it only will house about 80 homeless people. Um, that still leaves about 156 homeless people at any given time on the street if your program works. Is my understanding through the Lawrence Community Shelter's own mouth last week that only four people have tested positive for the illness and these are people are the only people that will be allowed into the homeless hotels anyway. I don't know how that applies to these other emergency shelter hotels that you're talking about. Um, whether or not if they're illness qualified or not, if they're allowed in the hotels. Um, so yeah, I'd say do what you're doing. It's good. And also approve what I just asked earlier, which is paid directly to Cotton's Hardware for all the supplies that other homeless people who are on the streets, in the woods, along the Kaw River need. Uh, like, I still have a bit of time left. Let me just list those off again so I can get them back in your heads. Uh, let's see. Okay. Cotton's Hardware sells firewood for $5.99 a bundle. Propane heaters at $89.99. Initial propane tank costs at $59.99 with each consecutive refill at $21.99. They sell 10 by 20 tarps at $24.99. 10 by 25 plastic painter tarp sheets at $14.99 and plastic trash can bags at $12.99 each with 32 bags. So that adds up to $12,680.65 and it can be reduced from a Cotton's Hardware discount I was told from the owner. Um, so yeah, I, I still have a minute left. I don't need time really. I just I just think there's more that can be done to actually help homeless people because some homeless people <clears throat> experience problems with any Lawrence Community Shelter related endeavor or whatever problem they have and um, they need to be supported regardless of whether or not they're in a shelter. Um, so again that list that I mentioned. Uh, I think it would be a great thing for helping them stay warm, especially those tarps and those propane heaters and trash can bags will help clean up their area and then we, as long as we get city porta potties there, trash and recycling services there, it'll clean it up even more. Thanks. Eric Hyde. Mayor Finkler, I don't think we have any other public comment. Any other questions or comments for C Manager? Okay, we'll move to calendar items. Looks like we have both 2020 and 2021. Any comments on the calendar? Vice Mayor Shipley, um, I, sorry, I can't see if it's on there right now, but I, I did want to point out, I was at Ribbon Cut It earlier, so I was reminded um, of the Lawrence Economic Outlook Conference. Um, that's February 4th, um, and probably a lot of us have maybe already registered for that, but um, also there's a small business um, uh, seminar that they'll be having January 28th, which will be virtual, obviously, uh, at 10 in the morning. Um, I think it might be a nice opportunity to hear from some of our local small businesses um, about suggestions they have or ideas that they have about, or even just their experience that they're going through. I'm sure we've heard a lot of it um, already, but um, still might be a nice opportunity to hear from them. Mayor Finkel, I, I, I do have that economic conference on the 4th. Who's hosting the one on the 28th? Is that a local chamber event? That's local chamber. Commissioner, sorry, Vice Mayor Shipley. Thank you. And what was the time again on that? 
Mayor Pinkelstein. That was Vice Mayor Shipley. That was 10 a.m. Thursday, January 28th. And uh, I believe you can um, register on the chamber, local Lawrence Chamber website. Mayor Pinkelstein, thank you. Any other calendar items? This Commissioner Bully, I'm unclear. Are those being added to our calendar? Mayor Finkel, I think at least the one on the fourth, February 4th should be, I think at least a couple of us will be there on that. I'm not sure on the 28th if anyone else plans to attend. Thanks, Mayor Shibley. I would like to, so if, if that means we need to put it on. This Commissioner and I need a better idea of what my work calendar looks like and being on campus or not before I can commit or not commit to anything. Mr. Commissioner, I think it'd be okay to just put them both on the calendar. Okay. Mayor Finkelstein, thank you. Other calendar items? If not, I'd look for a motion to adjourn. Commissioner Larson, move to adjourn. Commissioner Nond, a second. We have a motion to adjourn by Commissioner Lawson, a second by Commissioner Nanda. Commissioner Lawson? Aye. Commissioner Nanda? Aye. Vice Mayor Shepley? Aye. Commissioner Bowley? Aye. Mayor Finkel, aye. aye. Passes five to zero. My second meeting got done on the same day it started, so that's an improvement. <laughs> we will see you next time. Thank you. Bye. Hello.